Uh, good morning and welcome everyone to the 32nd meeting of the Local Government Communities <coughs> Committee in 2017. Remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and as meeting papers are provided in a digital format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. Uh, we've got a full house today. No apologies have been received. I'm going to move to agenda item one, which is the decision on taking business in private. The committee will decide whether consideration of its response to the Finance and Constitution Committee on the draft budget 2018-2019 should be taken in private at future meetings. Are we agreed? OK, thank you. Uh, so we move to agenda item two, which is draft budget scrutiny 2018-2019. The committee will take evidence of the Scottish Government's draft budget 2018-2019. And can I welcome uh, Derek Mackay, Cabinet Secretary for Finance and the Constitution, and Kevin Stewart, Minister for Local Government and Housing, Scottish Government, Bill Stitt, Team Leader Revenue and Capital, Marianne Barker, Non-Domestic Rates Group Secretary, Brad Gilbert, Head of Financial Innovation Unit, and Angus McLeod, Head of Tackling Fuel Poverty Unit. I hope I get everyone's titles uh, accurately there. Welcome everyone for coming along to either scrutiny of the draft budget. Um, can I invite opening statements from both the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister at this stage? I don't know who's going first. Cabinet Secretary? Yeah, uh, thanks, Convener. I welcome this opportunity to discuss the Government's spending priorities with you and hear the views of the Committee. As I made clear to Parliament, the 2018-19 budget is being delivered under the most challenging of circumstances. It is because of this uh, that the Scottish Parliament is proposing to use the powers of the Parliament to build a fairer Scotland, invest in our public services and support business to develop and thrive. Local authorities are our key partners in delivering the vital services that the people of Scotland expect and deserve, uh, which is why I have treated local government very fairly in providing a total settlement of over £10.5 billion. Within this total, I've been able to protect the resource budget in cash terms and increase their capital budget in real terms, which will result in a total increase in local authority core funding of £94 million. The Scottish Government is proposing to use its tax raising powers, and if local government <coughs> increase their council tax by 3%, they will raise an additional £77 million, also securing a real terms increase in local government spending on services again next year. On non-domestic rates, I believe we now offer what is the most attractive rates package in the UK. Uh, the number one budget ask of business was to cap the inflationary rise in the poundage at CPI rather than RPI. In my draft budget, I propose to deliver on that policy. I also propose a package of reliefs worth an estimated £720 million next year, including the small business bonus, which we have agreed to review as recommended by Barclay. The draft budget also includes a number of Scotland-only measures to cement Scotland as the best place to do business, and that includes nursery relief and the creation of a growth accelerator. I now hand over to Mr Stewart. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Despite uh, tough public expended expenditure conditions driven by Westminster, uh, we have managed to secure further significant investment for housing, including our ambitious affordable housing supply and energy efficiency programmes. Our draft budget for 1819 shows our commitment uh, to delivering on these with an increase to the More Homes budget while maintaining the fuel poverty and energy efficiency budget at its current level. I'd like to take each of these in turn, starting with how we are increasing the capital spending on housing supply. Uh, the budget doc document notes that the total spend on more homes will be increased by 24% uh, to £723 million. All of the £523 million more homes capital funding will be directly invested in the affordable housing supply programme, chiefly for social housing, together with the £92 million budget for TMDF, uh, which sit in the local government budget line. The total capital investment uh, will be £615 million. This is a £144 million increase on the equivalent figure for 2017-18 and will enable councils and housing associations to increase the momentum needed to accelerate the pace of delivery. Uh, we have also allocated £141 million of financial transactions to the affordable programme, which means that the total budget for affordable housing in 2018-19 will be £756 million. Uh, this is the most powerful way uh, to invest in housing supply for a fairer Scotland. 
Uh, turning now to improving energy efficiency, our focus continues to be on reducing overall energy costs for Scottish consumers uh, by improving e energy efficiency in homes where we can. Next year, we will allocate again £114 million uh, pounds to tackle this and improve the energy efficiency of our homes. This investment demonstrates our long-term commitment to address the challenges of climate change and also the inequality of fuel poverty in our society. Uh, and we'll deliver on this through our existing and developing fuel poverty programme, which offer a package of support to help those who are struggling to pay their energy bills and keep themselves warm. Finally, uh, I want to turn to the important matter of our ongoing work to tackle homelessness. Uh, the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group have already identified the immediate actions uh, needed to tackle rough sleeping this winter, which we are implementing right now. Uh, by late spring 2018, uh, they will be providing recommended longer-term actions to end rough sleeping, transform the use of temporary accommodation and move to end homelessness. In our programme for government, uh, we committed £50 million to the Ending Homelessness Together Fund over the next five years, with the first £10 million set out in this draft budget statement. <coughs> I look forward to the further recommendations of the Action Group early next year and to take forward a lasting change and improvement to ensure everyone has a safe and stable home. So overall, <coughs> despite the tough expenditure, public expenditure conditions, we will still provide significant investment, meeting our commitments to building more affordable homes, uh, improve energy efficiency and to end homelessness. Thank you, Convener. <coughs> Can I thank you for, for those opening statements? And I think it's only fair initially to put on record our thanks for additional transparency and information in relation uh, to this budget. This committee last year asked for more information at the point the, the Scottish Government budget was published so we could clearly read over between headline figures in the Scottish Government draft budget and various funding streams to local government. And I, and I think it's reasonable to say that's been provided. It's, it will help this committee with our scrutiny and will certainly help SPICE in relation to preparing uh, support for this morning session. So that that is welcome. Um, of course, the more numbers you get, the quicker you get them, doesn't change the, the annual perennial debate over whether local government has sufficient funding or not. Um, so a reasonable <coughs> opening question is, how would the Scottish Government ministers uh, respond uh, to criticism from local authorities and others that there's still not enough money in the pot to fund local government services? Maybe drill, drill down some of those numbers in a second, but how would you respond to those criticisms that have been made? Hey, thanks, Convener. I, I would say that it is a fair settlement, and bearing in mind that um, we have had a real terms reduction to our resource funding, um, uh, the, and we have many priorities within uh, Scottish Government. Uh, but working with our partners, it's true to say they were forecasting a much worse settlement and to be um, preparing for having far less resource than this draft budget proposes. Um, but I do believe the settlement that we've outlined is fair. And if I can describe the uh, negotiations that I have with COSLA, it <coughs> represents all 32 local authorities, and I uh, welcome the fact that it now uh, represents 32 out of 32 local authorities. Um, they have described that ongoing engagement as positive and uh, constructive. Um, so in outlining the uh, a proposed settlement to them, I know that uh, they recognise that it's better than they were expecting. I believe that it gives sufficient resources for them uh, to be able to deliver quality public services, uh, but they of course have their own fiscal lever of uh, council tax and can increase that up to 3% and that would generate £77 million, which if they used uh, would take their overall resources into real terms as well. Um, but I look forward to further engagement uh, with uh, uh, local authorities. Okay, uh, thanks Cabinet Secretary. Um, Nicosla um, have given us a, some supplementary evidence following the publishing of, 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 of the budget. But one of the things that COSLA does is they predicate inflation running at, at 3%, so they apply a 3% deflator, um, whereas the Scottish Government, I understand, has a deflator of 
five six percent. That makes quite a big difference in terms of whether the seventy seven million additional monies that could be raised by council tax brings local authorities into a real terms increase or a or, or a real terms cut. Uh, can I ask why there'd be such a difference in those figures and why the Scottish government one would be accurate? Um, well, Bill Stick maybe cover the um, uh, inflationary analysis. Of course, there's different um, there's different ways you can measure inflation, and um, we believe in terms of the services that they provide, this is the appropriate measure. But Bill can say more. Yeah, well, we use the HM Treasury approved GDP deflators, so uh, they obviously take into account different things, but it uh, more clearly reflects what's happening in government rather than the, the outside world. OK. Uh, do we elaborate on that any more? Well, we can provide more information on the factors that lie behind um, the uh, inflation statistics that are used, if you wish, uh, convener. OK. I, I'm also <laughs> just, just wondering, um, one of the benefits of, of having the additional information at the early stage is when governments, but also COSLA, for example, uh, put out their position, they talk about what they would apply that deflator to. So, for example, COSLA's latest briefing to, towards for this committee in relation to the budget would apply that deflator, it would appear, uh, to uh, overall Scottish government funding for local government at table 10.20. Um, which would include matters such as a uh, 121.9 million pound for city deals, uh, Clyde Gateway, uh, home efficiency programmes, re regeneration capital grant funding, a lot of capital funding in there that would apply a deflator to. Um, is it? D does the Scottish government take the view that all aspects of total spend should be viewed in that context, or should some have a deflator applied to it and not others? <clears throat> Again, Bill can cover the um, specific issue, but in relation to some of the specific funds that we arrive at by way of a deal to local government, and City Deals is a good example, um, which sets out a negotiation between UK government and Scottish government, local authorities as well, and there may be other partners uh, involved in City Deals, where um, the figure that we arrive at is essentially um, a deal. So city deals, like other elements, potential of capital expenditure um, as well is uh, the cost of providing that um, and an inflationary increase might not be relevant because if you take city deals, the budget line for that's uh, roughly doubled. The reason for that is more deals have been signed up to. Um, so I suppose analysing everything is, um, uh, uh, with the same um, uh, stick would not be appropriate. <coughs> the real terms increase that the Cabinet Secretary was mentioning was on the, the capital, the sorry, the local government settlement itself. As part of the, the committee's request, we have listed in the, the table 10.20 uh, all the other local government money that's not part of the core settlement. So none of those capital or revenue items have been included. <laughs> in our calculation of a real terms increase on the local government settlement. OK, that is helpful because I, th I think COSLA would appear to be taking a different approach. Another approach that, that, that COSLA are, are, are taking is specific commitments contained within the Scottish Government budget, which I, I know we'll all welcome. Um, uh, and I just want to read from their briefing, including money for early years and childcare expansion to 1,140 hours, uh, early learning and childcare expansion to 600 hours, uh, 66 million for health and social care, not ring fenced, and uh, 24 million for additional 1% for teachers' pay. Um, COSLA have costed a variety of, of commitments within the Scottish Government commitments that we're seeking a local government to deliver, and they've costed those. They've not said where they've got each figure to cost them from, but they are uh, totalling that to be £153 million, pounds, which, they're, which they're presenting as an additional burden on local authorities for services that maybe we would expect local authorities to be delivering and making progress on anyway. Has there been discuss discussions between COSLA and the Scottish Government in relation to what requires additional funding, uh, what's appropriate to ring fence, and what they should just go on and do? Uh, that's a fair question, convener, and I think it reflects some of the complexities of the local government settlement. 
and um, many of our priorities in our services are joint, they're partnership priorities. So if you take childcare, it's delivered largely by local authorities. Uh, they are key partners uh, in that. Health and social care integration, uh, by definition, uh, is a partnership uh, approach. So in the budget ne negotiations I would have with COSLA, uh, they are interested in quantum, i.e. the total resource that they'll have, uh, they're interested in a range of other pressures, and particularly interested in those pressures that they would take the view uh, that are uh, government-inspired uh, pressures. So all of that leads to negotiations. And if you take the teacher's pay settlement, uh, for them to be able to have been able to uh, deliver on that, then they saw extra government support. So in the 2018-19 financial settlement, I've described uh, the overall uh, settlement of a uh, flat cash essentially for a uh, resource uh, and an increase in capital, recognising again that there's a lot of areas in which there's partnership working on uh, with local authorities. I mean, housing is absolutely critical. Local authorities are a key partner in that. Um, city deals absolutely as well. Within resource, those figures that you mentioned, convener, um, are the areas where we've engaged with local authorities. And if you take health and so social care integration, I specifically ask local authorities, um, what is the figure that assists you with your health and social care integration pressures? What is the sum? And the sum that's been allocated within the settlement reflects the ask to Scottish Government, uh, as does the teachers' pay um, uh, support and the expansion of uh, early learning uh, and childcare um, as well. So those are some key elements of us from local government to recognise their pressures built within the settlement. Uh, and I, I suppose what local government was really concerned about was that if they had an overall reduction in the quantum, and as I say, many councils were forecasting for 3%, in fact, a reduction, that's about £300 million or more, plus dealing with extra pressures on top of that, they felt would leave them in a more vulnerable uh, position. So that's why through the course of the negotiations uh, with COSLA, uh, we've been able to make sure there's resource within the settlement to be able to support those pressures. Okay, so, so the COSLA position, I, I'm going to read it out because I want to just make sure that, that, that I capture it correctly. COSLA's view is that there is a £153 million revenue reduction to the core 2018-19 settlement. To calculate this, we have simply taken the Scottish Government flash cash position, flat cash position and highlighted the new burdens that have been confirmed would be fully funded for local government. Our view is that if these items are funded, then there is a reduction to the core settlement, uh, and that's where they think they're 153 million pounds. Is the Scottish government position that they're just wrong? Then, so, 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 what would the Scottish government view be of that? No, it'd be their interpretation. I mean, I, I would say again that areas like um, childcare, it's this Parliament that will be. Uh, legislating to increase provision. We want to make sure that local authorities are resourced to, to do that. And if you take some of the investment in childcare, it will be expanding and improving uh, nurseries to enhance their capacity uh, to get to the 140 hours. I, I suppose my point around interpretation is this is real money, this is real cash, it's sustaining that which uh, local government has. I know it's challenging times for public services, and I know that local authorities will be feeling pressures, but those were the areas of negotiation where the Scottish Government was asked to recognise the partnership approach and put that sum in. If local authorities, for the purpose of their briefings, or wanting to improve their uh, quantum, and I understand that, want to describe it uh, as not core money, that's up to them. What I'm saying is it's real cash, it's investing in partnership priorities. There are figures that we've discussed with local authorities, and I, of course, now write to the 32 local authorities and ask for their agreement to deliver uh, on uh, uh, commitments and whether they accept uh, the settlement. So they will say it's not core money. I say it's for partnership priorities, and you've touched upon them, convener, primarily around uh, early learning and childcare and health and social care integration as well. I, I suppose, finally, before I move to colleagues to, to develop th th this further, you mentioned that... Uh, local authorities were preparing for a very different settlement. Um, what settlement do you think local authorities were preparing for and what's changed? I, so I I'd obviously engage with directors of finance. I met a number of council leaders over the course of the last few months. I regularly meet COSLA uh, uh, leadership teams. Uh, they were expecting, uh, maybe informed by others, but certainly they, their assumption was about 3% reduction. That would be a £300 million cash reduction on settlement. So, if you like, 
£300 million less than the figure that they have now received in the settlement, because flat cash is essentially you know, 0% reduction. They were forecasting, <laughs> preparing for, and many councils published options for saving with that in mind. Um, now, there'd be a range. Of course, there's always a range. It's forecasting, it's assumptions of anywhere between a 2% reduction and somewhere as, as low or as high, depending on your point of view, as a 5%, a £500 million pounds reduction. And that was because of the view that maybe um, commentators have taken uh, that the government wouldn't have used our uh, tax powers, that the government was investing in a manifesto commitments in a fashion that they arrived at that uh, uh, reduction figure. Well, that's not the, the figure that I'm proposing in the settlement. It's far more positive than any local authority in the country was predicting. I'm not dismissing that it's challenging for those delivering uh, public services, and there's increasing, of course, expectation and demand on our public services. <coughs> um, uh, they will uh, face... Um, a, as I say, uh, further challenges because of ongoing austerity um, uh, as well, welfare reform uh, and so on. So I think it's a, it's a very fair settlement in that context and I don't think it's unreasonable for the government to earmark and ring fence resources where we believe it's a priority. One good example of that, challenged by those who don't believe in ring fencing, is the Pupil Equity Fund, £120 million. The evidence is that it's being uh, spent directly on, on that which will help tackle the attainment gap, and it's ensured that uh, hundreds more uh, teachers have been employed, and hopefully will make a difference in outcomes and attainment. But it's just an example of how ring fencing, whilst in principle not might sit comfortably with all of us, it actually uh, in many regards uh, works. Uh, if I recall rightly, Cabinet Secretary, I think I remember both COSLA and Unison coming to the committee lamenting ring fencing. And it's interesting you mentioned the Pupil Equity Fund because we specifically said, do they agree with ring fencing? No, they didn't. But we specifically asked them whether they would take money away from that. There was no comment really to be made. So there's an interesting dynamic there between what is and isn't appropriate to ring fence, which the committee might might return to. But we'll allow, we'll allow others in to develop some of the arguments here. And our Deputy Convener wants to follow up on some of this. Thanks very much, Convener. And thank you, Cabinet Secretary and Minister, for joining us this morning. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, just to, to explore this slightly further, it's not just COSLA, but also the STUC, and I'm just going to quote them in the briefing that they put out, have said, the Scottish Government may have received a real terms cut from Westminster, but it still received cash terms increase of £188 million. Local Government, however, can expect worse treatment from the Scottish Government as their cash terms budget is frozen. So the STUC are also um, expressing concerns about real terms cuts to local government. Have you responded to their concerns yet? Uh, again, over the course of the last uh, couple of months, as, as Elaine Smith would expect, I've met a number of stakeholders, including the STUC, and they raised uh, a number of matters with me. Uh, not just local government, they would be, uh, trade unions would be con concerned about a, a range of issues. Uh, not least uh, public sector pay policy as well. Uh, they engage very constructively in the tax uh, debate. And that's a key feature uh, this year to ensure that we went from real terms reduction in <coughs> uh, resource uh, to be able to invest in real terms uh, growth. And principally, uh, that was towards the National Health Service um, because, yes, there's demand, yes, there's a... Um, a a, a need for that, but there's no doubt that, that the NHS is a very precious service. So too are local authority services, but uh, local authorities also have the ability to raise the council tax as well, and that would uh, increase their uh, income and the resources that they have um, uh, available. So we have to make choices and set out our priorities, and I think we've done so in the budget in a very fair way, whilst also ensuring that there's economic growth so that we can have future uh, revenues to continue to invest in our public services. So, as I say, STUC raised a, a number of matters, um, a pay policy um, overall, investment or public services, the discussion on tax and local government um, a too, but obviously the government and the, therefore the parliament has to make a choices. A local government, of course, will campaign for more resource. They always have, they always will. I did so when I was a council leader um, as well. It's a, to be uh, expected. Yeah, but I think in the context of reductions that we face, the uh, local government has been treated fairly. Thanks, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Thanks, Convener. If I could just continue briefly. Yes. Uh, of course, yeah, choices do have to be made in the STC going 
um, to make that point about the Scottish Government's revenue raising powers in the briefing and the choices that can be made. But if we look at local government specifically and the NHS, then a lot of the, the services that are provided in local government, there's an interconnection there because many of those services would take pressure off the NHS if they were fully funded and, and properly provided. So I think we, we just have to to recognise that. But Cabinet Secretary talked about pay policy, which again is another issue that has been raised. And looking back at the COSLA paper, the additional the, the, the dispute, if you like, that, that you're maybe having about um, the you know reduction to the core or not reduction to the core, one of those issues is the, the teachers' pay settlement. And what Eunice in Scotland ha have pointed out is that um, the Teachers are directly employed by local councils, and so they negotiate their pay through COSLA. However, they feel there's some confusion because if the Scottish Government is uh, taking action with regard to teachers' pay, then why can't the Scottish Government then uh, apply that to that approach to ensure adequate pay funding for all public sector workers? Now, I appreciate that um, the Scottish Government have, of course, lifted the pay cap um, for certain got certain workers in the public sector, but the point Unison would be making is that the Scottish Government lifting of that doesn't then apply to many workers that are low paid in the public in the local government sector. I think, uh, uh, if I can just correct one thing uh, that, that Elaine Smith has said specifically, uh, teachers' pay isn't dealt with just through COSLA, it's tripartite arrangements with the Scottish Government as well, and that's very specific arrangements around uh, uh, teachers' pay. Um, and I think it's fair that when government engages in that, they think about the overall resource that local government has to be able to pay. Ultimately, as the employer, of course, of, of um, uh, teachers, um, Scottish government should engage uh, constructively in that. And so you would see that as the key difference then to uh, the teacher situation, the point that Unison's asking to the teacher situation and the situation of the other local government workers. I think we are. I think there is a clear difference where the Scottish government is part of the tripartite negotiating arrangements around pay for an element of the workforce being teachers. And to be able to secure a satisfactory deal with the workforce, uh, local government asked for more resource, and they got that. So because, yes, because we are part of the negotiating uh, around the teachers' pay deal, I think that's different from other categories of council staff, over which government doesn't really have a say as to what the pay policy would be for local government. And many would argue shouldn't have a say uh, out with teachers because of the very specific nature of the tripartite uh, arrangements um, and, and, and that framework. For overall Scottish Government pay policy, I set out pay policy that covers all those uh, working within our control. And then elements within that as well, uh, Elaine Smith will be uh, very aware of, uh, will be around uh, health. Well, there's also an independent pay review that may return with a different proposition to my pay policy, and I've said we'll at least match that. So all of this, of course, is contextualises what local government might do with a pay award. And frankly, of course, local government said to me, you know, be mindful of what you do in pay because it will give us um, issues of uh, consistency. But it is a matter for local authorities as to where they set any pay uh, increase and any change on what they were modelling for. Now, COSLA may say, uh, as they have done through briefings, one thing. Uh, I haven't seen much detail on this yet, uh, but I've seen at least one council leader publicly say that the settlement that they are receiving will now allow them uh, to match government pay policy. Now, that's one leader, albeit, but, you know, uh, it was a co-leader of, I think, a Fife Council just from memory. Mm -hmm. And I just make that point that it's a view. Um, and knowing that the settlement is better than they were anticipating, knowing that they would have uh, faced pressure for a pay uplift, uh, then I think they're in a reasonable place. Okay, thanks, Cabinet Secretary, because you obviously make the point that it does raise aspirations amongst other public sector workers uh, if there's promises made to one sector and perhaps others feel they might miss out. <coughs> but, uh, yeah, I appreciate you've, you've put your point on the record about that. If I can just make um, the point, though, it's absolutely not for me to instruct local authorities where to set a pay settlement. When it's happened in the past, there's been industrial disputes and government doesn't ordinarily give a view on what any pay settlement should be. But I think the context is that we have recognised um, the uh, cost uh, of uh, inflation on household uh, budgets. 
but we also want to sustain and protect um, public sector workers and in our pay policy, it's been just as in our tax policy, our pay policy has been more progressive um, as well. Uh, no compulsory redundancies and support for uh, those that have uh, lower pay as well. Uh, key features of our policy, and I would imagine that is not ailing concepts to local government, but I appreciate they now have to negotiate with their own workforce, and I would argue with a better settlement than they had been expecting, one that's fair and one that gives them further flexibility. Another element of the deal, and I'm happy to share the correspondence with the committee, but it's still um, live with COSLA at the moment, is uh, increasing flexibility within the settlement um, uh, around um, some of the flexibilities that local government was looking for, just to make the point that they have a bit more room for manoeuvre than arguably they had in previous years. Thanks. Okay. Right. A lot to get through uh, this morning. Uh, Minister, I promise you at some point we've all got on to housing. Might be a wee bit before we get there, but we will do. Um, Alexander Stewart. Uh, thank you, convener. One of the biggest issues facing local authority delivery of health and social care, that has been identified. Uh, have the Scottish Government done any evaluation or assessment carried out by the, the Government themselves to ascertain the ability of the integrated joint boards? Uh, maintaining the services under the pressures they have, under the constraints they have and the cuts? Well, there's actually increased uh, resources for health and social uh, uh, care, not a reduction. And to be fair to local authorities, um, they have invested more, as has the um, Scottish Government. So there is an element of the settlement uh, of £66 million pounds investment in social care coming from Scottish Government to local authorities. It, that's roughly what local government asked me for. That's where the negotiations got to. That was the sum that they felt would address their um, pressures. Uh, as to the uh, further uh, clinical or demand uh, aspects, that would be a question for the health secretary. Um, but certainly in, in the fiscal and the finance uh, negotiations I've had with local government, we know there's increasing pressures, and it goes back to Elaine Smith's point <coughs> that if we have more infrastructure at a community level, that is good uh, and helpful uh, for acute. Uh, integration's generally been a good thing. Uh, the resources following the patient um, rather than the bureaucracy. So all of that's good, but the, the allocation I've given within the proposed settlement it meets the ask that I ultimately got from local authorities. Yes, there's increasing demand on the service, and that's why there's increasing support and flexibility. The partnership working has, has certainly been a, a huge advantage uh, to the, the whole aspect of local government and social care. Uh, and, and you rightly identify uh, that there will still be pressures going forward, uh, and there will still be burdens on the service. Uh, but <coughs> at, at the end of the day, uh, th there is still an opportunity for uh, development going forward. And I think that maybe the money you have given uh, may cover the situation at this stage. But as we progress uh, with an ageing population and all the aspects that have to be participated in that process, I think it will still be a massive problem. Do you not agree with that? I, I certainly agree with the point that the changing demography is a challenge, that the increasing pressure and expectations on the service are a challenge. I uh, have reflected on the fact that we want uh, care workers to be properly uh, supported financially, and that's why the living wage delivery was so important as well. But yes, further transformation in the health service has to be delivered, and social care, and that's why it's a twin-track approach of investment and transformation. Closer joint working between health and social care is absolutely valuable and important. This is the right direction of travel, and extra resources have been allocated. And I entirely appreciate the point from Alexander Stewart around further resources may well be required in future. I just make the gentle reminder to Alexander Stewart as a Conservative that if I had followed the Tories' tax plans, I'd be looking for £501 million worth of cuts from across the public sector, not growth in the budget, which is essentially what uh, most parts of the public service will receive. You, you, you talk about a, a sort of fair deal, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, you know, within my own region, and you've uh, you've touched on that. I'm in Mid Scotland and Fife. I mean, Tayside and Fife are seeing a cut of 23 million uh, across, and my own uh, council, Perth and Kinross, uh, is getting the, the most severe of 5.4 million. So, how do you reckon that is a fair deal? Uh, in terms of what uh, numbers is Mr. Stewart referring to exactly? <clears throat> well. There's, there's been information come out in the press today. Uh, my own uh, authority, my own person, Canrosa, are looking at a 2.3 cut 
uh, £5.4 million. Uh, that's, what they're, that's what they're indicating uh, they're going to receive uh, under the settlement situation today. And that, as I say, Tayside and Fife are looking at a £23 million uh, reduction on day-to-day -day services. I don't recognise those numbers, convener, and I'm happy to. I mean, I recognise that we've made much progress in transparency and simplicity. Uh, in terms of that, uh, and that's a bit of a contradiction in terms of local government finance, albeit. <laughs> but we've been able to give a more information than before. Yeah. Real terms, um, in terms of cash freeze for resource, yeah. real terms uh, in capital, we are... Um, We've circulated uh, figures to local authorities. I don't recognise those numbers. It may well be that local authorities are presenting um, what they believe to be their um, pressures uh, overall, uh, but we have got a, a significant sum still to be allocated. And, Convener, you'll be familiar with the uh, annual occurrence of portfolios having... A, sums that are then transferred to local authorities, but once the portfolio is in a position to determine how that's distributed. And sometimes that's engagement with COSLA as well. So when that total resource is distributed, uh, local authorities uh, will essentially f have the reflection of that overall you know, cash uh, freeze and, uh, in terms of resource and then increasing capital. I should say one other thing that... Um, local authorities specifically asked me for as much convergence as possible in the distribution of resources so that no council got uh, against dis disproportionately more or less, so there's the convergence as well, which, which tries to ensure fairness for each local authority within the overall settlement. So I don't recognise those numbers, and I, I've certainly, I will re-provide to the committee, um, council by council, the settlement figures we propose, whilst recognising there's a further sum to be distributed to local authorities, which will... I think, counter those figures that um, Mr Stewart told me he read in the press. Um, but looking at the, the summary we've had from Spice, uh, they recognise that there is a, a total revenue uh, has fallen by 0.2.7%, which they talk about £157.3 million, pound, Cabinet Secretary. So that figure is there <coughs> as a total revenue reduction. That goes back to the very first point that the convener was making around... Um, I have described the partnership priorities around teachers' pay, investment in social care, the expansion of early learning and childcare. Uh, surely all of that is um, partnership priorities with local <coughs> government. So that's real cash, real resource, going to local authorities and as part of the settlement. If you discount that, yes, you arrive at a different figure. I include it because it's real cash going to local authorities. Thank Simple you. as that. Can I just mop up on, on those, that question from Alexander Stewart? You mentioned other monies that were still to be added into individual local authority settlements, and obviously there's a budget line there for integrated joint boards. I think the global amount that will be transferred in is clear, but obviously the amount to each individual local authority is not. So are local authorities flying blind a little bit in relation to how much money will eventually go in there? And could you give an example of other portfolios where you'd anticipate those monies going in, that would be quite helpful for the committee. Sure. The total figure is about £10.5 billion, pounds, and I think the yet-to-be-distributed uh, sum is about £200 million. Pounds. Uh, Bill Stelt will give you more detail on that. So I think that gives you a sense of they've got sure. a, a great deal of certainty. The reason we put the circular out in the fashion that we do a budget last week is to consult with local authorities. Uh, they may come back with an anomaly, an inaccuracy, a misunderstanding, whatever it happens to be. So we won't have that as a settled figure. That gives us the opportunity to uh, consult with local authorities and then we return with the actual finance order uh, that Parliament's expected to receive. If Parliament doesn't uh, 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 support it, then the, the money isn't uh, issued, uh, but we return for the local government finance order. Um, Bill can give you an example that you've asked for. Can you yeah, give a, a portfolio that distributes? Yeah. yeah, well, it's all within the £10.5 uh, total. And we distribute as much as has been agreed with COSLA on the, the needs based formula. So, examples of sums not yet agreed or distributed uh, is the early years expansion, for example, because it's only coming to the fore now. Uh, there's a meeting set up for early January to agree the distribution of the, the early years expansion, and that will be included in the, the local government finance order. 
Similarly, with discretionary housing payments, COSLA wanted a review of the, the distribution mechanism, so that's going to the same meeting, which will, will be agreed. The criminal justice social work, which was a ring fence grant and is now <coughs> part of the overall settlement, looking at the, the, the distribution of it. Uh, and as normal teachers' induction scheme, that's not distributed till towards the end of the year because we need to find out how many teachers have been inducted. Uh, coming back to the point, that Mr Stewart, on Perth and Kinross, when looking at a like-with-like like example, the 2018-19 of the amounts that have been distributed, it's somehow like 27,000 lower than it was in the current year. So with some of these other sums, it, it's likely to be an increase rather than the, the reduction. OK, and, and then just briefly, um, so in Table 10.13, under other sources of support, the £355 million in the draft budget for health and social care integration, which we anticipate will be transferred to integrated joint boards. Um, do local authorities effectively know what share of that they'll get now? Well, that's for the, that's for the actual health and social care integration boards, so that's money that the local government doesn't need to, to put into the boards. Now, what I mean, but, but the local authorities know what each board is getting. So has there been a breakdown yet of that 355? Not, not as far as I'm aware, but the, the, the health uh, officials will be uh, writing to the integration right. boards. OK, now that, that, that is helpful. It's just that sometimes local authorities over the last year and this year will come to the committee and they will include monies they have to spend, which does include integration joint board monies, and sometimes they won't include it. So it's just obviously Mr Stewart's got a line of questioning about monies that his local authority has and what's unclear is whether that includes IGB monies and we're just trying to get a bit of clarity around that. that, that that's that's well, All these sums that I've just mentioned exclude yeah. that money. Okay. I ju just to make one point, uh, no, just because it's a helpful one, some people may read in the press, uh, members may read in the press, a, a figure from their local authority of reduction, but that might be what the local authority has... Uh, uh, assumed is a figure before, because that's what we've been experiencing in the last few weeks. The assumptions from local authorities and what the reduction they thought would be, and therefore their planning assumption, as opposed to what the settlement actually proposes for local government. So there is a difference between what councils thought they might get and put in the public domain and what we propose to supply. OK, thank you. Hey, Jenny Goldruth. Um, just to actually highlight that, that point, Cabinet Secretary, we have quite a, a frankly bizarre situation in Fife at the moment. You might have heard some of David Ross's comments. Um, he said last week, if we raise pay for some workers through proposed tax changes, it will mean cutting other services and probably losing other jobs. But then yesterday, David Alexander, the SNP co-leader in which he is in administration with, said actually Fife Council would be fine. And that, as in the case of Childcare, as we've already highlighted this morning, the council would be creating jobs to fill those posts. So um, it's a bit of a disconnect going on, I think, on the front line. But with regard to service redesign, um, do you have a view with regard to councils charging for services which might previously have been free? So, for example, in Fife, uh, the council introduced charges on a Sunday uh, for parking um, uh, to offset budgetary pressures. Uh, so, I, that's a, a Jenny Goldruth asked quite a controversial question. Again, it wouldn't necessarily be appropriate for a minister to set out what, what local authorities should do with individual um, charging uh, regimes. But it is another fiscal lever that local authorities uh, have, not particularly substantial. Of course, they have council tax as well, uh, but they are uh, the, the main funding source, of course, for local authorities uh, is uh, uh, grant support. A revenue um, support grant. So we wouldn't normally express a view on uh, individual charges for of individual local authorities, but it is entirely up to them. Okay. Um, there has been a suggestion in previous sessions that councils will need to strip back their services and just allow for uh, the provision of frontline services. And I know, again, in Fife, uh, under the previous Labour administration, they took the decision to close 16 libraries, which is not a frontline service, but did impact upon the poorest and the most vulnerable. Does the government monitor how services are provided across the country in terms of how they're impacting upon the most vulnerable? We've had, the Scottish Government has essentially single outcome agreements, so we have an agreement with local authorities on, on, on a partnership approach, what, what we're trying to achieve, what the outcomes for a local area. Um, of course, the main uh, audit agencies look at performance of local authorities, what their outcomes are as well, how they're using um, resources. Um, you've touched on, on leisure and culture. I would make the point yeah. um, 
the local authority that, that I, um, I, I live in in Renfrewshire had huge cultural aspirations, dashed by the not getting the city of culture uh, bid. But their culture plans are going on anyway, so they'll mm. still be investing in facilities and they'll yeah. still be delivering events. I just use that as, as, as an anecdote, a point around core services being delivered, but councils can still choose to do that, which is important to them in their area. <laughs> but broadly speaking, it's a single outcome agreement between government and all community plan uh, partners, uh, but the audit agencies look at the performance uh, of local authorities <laughs> Uh, how they're performing, how they're meeting their statutory um, uh, indicators. Um, and then at a national level, we have uh, Scotland Performs, of course, that looks at overall national performance. So there's a, a range of ways that Council's performance and delivery is monitored. Thank you. OK, uh, Graham Simpson. Thank you. Um, I'm a little bit confused, I must be honest. Um, is it your position that no Council will have to make any cuts? I mean, that's for local authorities to determine. It's my position local government has got a fair settlement. Um, uh, and uh, as I say, it's far better than was forecast. I think the negotiations have gone well with COSLA uh, in that they've raised a number of asks and have been able to support <coughs> them in that particular pressure points. Will local authorities have to continue to make efficiencies? Yes, they will. They actually have a target of... Uh, approximately 3% uh, every year. They, they write to me every year to uh, confirm that they've been meeting their efficiency targets. And I have also recognised that these are challenging times for all our public services whilst expectations um, rise. But we, as a, as a government, are proposing to use our tax powers to ensure that we can adequately resource our public services. And local authorities also have that ability in relation to uh, council tax, enhanced <coughs> council tax as well, because we've uh, increase the multiplier for the ha higher value uh, homes as well. So um, I know um, uh, Mr Simpson will want to use some pejorative language, uh, but I do think it's a fair settlement. Will it require tough choices? Of course it will. Of course it will. We've had tough choices to make in government um, uh, as well. Uh, but essentially, um, I think it's a good deal for local government. Well, it's not pejorative language to say that councils will have, have to make cuts, which you've just confirmed. I want to um, move on to a, uh, another subject. Um, can you tell us what advice the Scottish Government's been given regarding the potential anomaly in giving profit-making private nurseries a tax break? You mentioned that in your opening statement. When nurseries um, in independent schools, which are charities and which assist the Scottish Government and councils with the provision of additional places for three- and four-year-olds, would be ineligible for the same tax break? Of course, the recommendations uh, stem from the Barclay um, uh, report into uh, non-domestic rates, uh, how we can uh, use it more effectively. I think the position on nurseries and giving 100% rates relief supports the government policy in expanding early learning and childcare, so it's a supportive policy and it was a recommendation of Barclay uh, that I was uh, happy to accept. And we haven't distinguished between um, a private and uh, council-run uh, nurseries. If we want to improve the quality of nursery provision, then we will have to invest in it. So there's the direct investment around training, capacity and uh, placements, um, that resource uh, in uh, infrastructure also. Uh, but uh, the rates relief will support uh, all nurseries as well. So that was a clear recommendation of Barclay, and we intend to see it through. In relation to independent schools, um, the recommendation from Barclay was to remove um, rates relief from all independent schools. It was all of them. Uh, but what I've uh, decided to do, following the engagement and reflection, is ensure that within that, um, special schools, uh, special independent schools, and those with a very specialist nature uh, continue to have that rates relief. And that's the distinction. Mainstream independent schools, um, it is proposed, don't continue to enjoy that rates relief. However, it doesn't change their charitable status. I've seen some press coverage to suggest that it changes their charitable status. We don't believe that it does. Um, and it's also been suggested that we can't separate out the two, and I believe uh, that we can. So uh, there will be forthcoming secondary um, a, a legislation uh, in due course. 
Now, the other point about that is that there is plenty of time to prepare for that as well, in terms of the difference for independent schools, but for nurseries, uh, we're proposing a quicker implementation so they can enjoy the rates relief earlier. Okay, it sounds like you, you maybe didn't take any advice um, re relating to, to my first question, uh, but looking at the, uh, the independent schools sector, um, <coughs> can you tell me what analysis you did of the potential knock-on effect to the state sector of introducing non-domestic rates to the independent sector? If I can probe a bit further, I, I thought I gave a quite a comprehensive uh, answer on the difference between uh, a nursery and an independent mainstream school. So I'm to I, I apologise for stopping there. Of course, you must, you must continue to answer this question. And I, of course, you want our supplementary. That's fine, Mr Simpson. But can I, can I remind colleagues as how this would impact on the local government financial settlement and knock-on consequences on, on services, given that we are doing budget scrutiny, but I'm given a degree of latitude. Which, which is exactly what my question is. Okay. Um, I, I have <clears throat> engaged with independent schools. I've looked at the evidence that is supplied to me. When I got the Barclay recommendation uh, to a, a lift rates relief for independent schools, although I accepted a, a, a number of recommendations very swiftly and... Uh, I said there were some that required further reflection, engagement and consultation, and that was one. Uh, so I would object to any suggestion that I didn't engage in the subject. I have uh, uh, fully explored uh, the information that was presented to me. There was uh, officials' uh, meetings uh, as well. I have uh, come to the view that in terms of independent schools, if you look at the total income for independent schools, uh, the change in status for non domestic rates shouldn't have a disproportionate effect on the financial running of those schools. And the information I have seen suggests that there won't be a mass exodus from independent mainstream schools to state schools. Therefore, there should not be massive extra expenditure to those education authorities that might have more pupils. I say this. I think this is the right thing to do in terms of independent schools. And it doesn't affect their charitable status. But it has been put to me that some independent schools may well change their um, a, a bursary support for those that might not otherwise be able to afford to go to independent schools. I actually think that all children deserve the best education, and, and that's why we've put more resource into education. But I don't think there'll be a disproportionate effect. I think that the uh, sums involved in non-domestic rates can be absorbed by those um, uh, schools. Yeah, I mean, the reason I ask the question is because um, you know, fee, fees could be uh, increased and that could uh, mean that some pupils leave that sector and go into the state sector. Uh, I spoke to the Scottish Council of Independent Schools. Um, they say that up to one in ten pupils uh, may, may leave that sector. Now, that could be thousands of pupils going into the state sector. So that has an impact on council budgets. So I merely ask, did you do any analysis around that? Yes, of course. I'd say for the third time, I looked at the evidence that was presented to me by independent schools, by their representative organisations and direct meetings I had and meetings we had with officials. And if you look at overall uh, the cost to an independent school of non-domestic rates, I say again, it shouldn't have a disproportionate impact and in terms of fees, I mean, I suspect on the other um, inflationary increases that independent schools have had, you know, the, the, the figure of, again, 10% I don't recognise as a likely shift from independent schools to state schools. I can tell you also that it has been put uh, to me uh, that many people would take a very dim view if independent schools became arguably more elitist because they had to pay non-domestic rates, which incidentally puts them in the same league as council schools. Okay, I think we, you can ask us something no, that's on a different topic. Okay. Um, Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Thanks, Cabinet Secretary. Um, just a few sort of clarifications. Um, We've had a briefing from Spice, and we certainly, I think, as the convener said, welcome the greater sort of transparency in the numbers this year. I, I take it you broadly agree with the numbers in Spice? There's no issues you have with any of those numbers? I broadly agree with the numbers. I yep. say it's a matter of interpretation of whether you count 
what I allocate sure. as cash yep. in a settlement um, as yep. uh, as part yep. of the settlement or not, I would argue there yep. is, but I'm not objecting broadly to the numbers that's okay. approximately in that area. Uh, another of our question arises from, from when we had the Accounts Commission about the uprating in council <coughs> tax, uh, the uplift in the top bans. Uh, last year that was um, given directly to the council within which that arose. Can I just clarify that this year that's being distributed through the normal formula? He, he, the same applies as, as last year, which is that every council keeps every penny in council tax that they um, uh, that is raised in their area, so that multiplier stays in the pot for local authorities uh, to use. Yeah. But the, the council tax, the council tax receipts form part of the formula. Last year the uplift in the top four bans was, if you like, ring-fenced for the councils in which they arose and was not subject to the formula. I'm just asking whether this year it will be. OK, I've got distribution, I'll ask Bill to come in. Yes, yeah, we, uh, we raised that with COSLA at our um, joint settlement and distribution group, and it was agreed we would revert back to the previous equalisation process. OK, that's helpful. It was left uh, separately in 1718 because of the question about how it was to be funded. Yep. No, I understand. That's very, very helpful. Thanks very much. Um, I think also there's a continuing debate around ring fencing, obviously. Um, I mean, you mentioned you have some partnership working and you, you, you have uh, resource um, monies allocated within resource uh, for that, and you have other monies that are out with, and I think most of us would accept that however one describes it, ring fencing or not, is, 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 is appropriate in certain circumstances. I've got a meeting with the um, Education Cabinet Secretary to raise a question of the legacy from 2008 on some of that previous ring fencing. It's a good example of it with the specialist music schools. There was obviously an issue with the City of Edinburgh Music School. Edinburgh wanted to close it. Um, but because that ring fencing had gone, it's, it's very unclear as to the status of that money and whether that money, because it falls within the general settlement, is still for that purpose or not. Um, have you got any plans to kind of review how some of that legacy that was a ring fence that was then taken into the gen into the settlement in 2008 could be clarified, particularly in those areas like specialist schools, which are still in existence. Some of those previous ring fence funds are no longer applicable. I remember um, uh, that period very well because I was a local authority leader uh, at the time. Um, I, and welcome the direction of travel. The uh, short answer to the question is I have no immediate plans to review, uh, as, as Mr Whiteman has described, uh, uh, legacy elements of uh, the grant settlement. That said, every year <coughs> local authorities through COSLA negotiate with me and raise areas of where they might want more flexibility uh, or, or different asks. So we still have that engagement uh, every year, but I have no immediate plans to review uh, the uh, historic elements of the settlement. Okay. Um, moving on to non-domestic rates, um, in terms of the draft budget for 2018-19, uh, the net, the overall impact of policy proposals is, is an additional £28 million, according to the Scottish uh, Fiscal Commission, 164 from income tax policy, but a lot of that is, is reduced by the changes to non-domestic rates uh, regimes, particularly uh, the business growth accelerator and the switch to CPI. What economic impact assessments been made of the business growth accelerator, and what what you know what economic impact is that likely to have? The the workings around that is uh, the growth accelerator specifically was a recommendation from Barclay to use our existing powers to uh, try and stimulate growth uh, within uh, the business community. It had been described. And it, there isn't a figure that says this amount of intervention equals this amount of economic uh, growth. But the evidence that was received by the business organisations, and I think that's why the panel would have recommended uh, this, uh, took uh, the view that it was very difficult for businesses who maybe wanted to invest in their property or their premises to do so without even having a chance to, to raise some revenue. <coughs> So the view around that was if there was a bit of respite or period of grace, as it is a period of a year, uh, then that would allow uh, businesses to have a bit of time to raise revenue following their improvement, their expansion or whatever it happens to be. And in terms of business growth, um, that contrasts very favourably uh, with south of the border or anywhere else in the UK for that matter, uh, that um, 
a, there is that not immediate um, buoyancy, if you like, that immediate um, cost of improving your premises. A, and the, the view of a business was, <coughs> excuse me, that would be a stimulant to the economy, a stimulant to those wanting to invest in their properties and give a bit of support and ultimately would pay for itself because of the extra investment that it would bring in support. I just ask, the Scottish Fiscal Commission have, have uh, judged that, um, apart from the change to public sector pay policy, their judgment is that the policies in the budget are not of a large enough magnitude to have a significant aggregate impact on the Scottish economy. Um, so we'll leave it there. On the small business bonus scheme, what's the cost of the small business bonus scheme in terms of revenue foregone? Hey, Marianne, have you got that? Yeah, just give me a second. I think it's around about um, 230 million next year, okay. forecast. Yep. If I'm incorrect, I will um, issue a, an email letting you know the up-to-date figure. Okay. And I, I understand, obviously, you've taken the Barclay Review recommendation to, to, to review that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, when are you going to review it? How's that going to be done? The timescale we set out in the implementation plan was... It'll, um, the review of the small business bonus will commence in the new year. In the new year. Uh, because I was looking at a letter that, um, Cabinet Secretary, you wrote to the Rural Affairs Committee where you noted that the new um, properties that are coming in to the valuation role, um, uh, the, the shootings and sportings, um, there's 10,300 10, uh, of them uh, with a total rateable value of around 16 uh, million pounds. But in analysis that was published in a Freedom of Information request, and indeed is freely available from the Scottish Assessor's website in any event, um, of those 10,000 uh, or so properties, uh, 10,174 are valued at less than 15,000, and a mere 72 are above 15,000. So the, the idea of getting four or five or six million pounds yield when virtually 99.9% .9 of these are eligible for small business relief seems a bit uh, strange. And you have people like Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, the ruler of Dubai, who won't be paying any tax at all because of the small business bonus scheme. Does that seem fair? I, I think it's quite hard for me to talk about any individual. I don't know the gentleman or his tax affairs or... Um, or any of the background. I'm happy to look into any details to see how we're applying small business bonus if you think it is um, fair. I, I can double check those numbers in terms of that, but what a small businesses may be able to do, of course, is benefit from small business bonus scheme, but it does only apply up to state aid limits, and there are only so many properties that a, a, a proprietor a, could have small business bonus on. A, I am he loath to give a view on any individual, as I say, um, business affairs. I can also clarify, the assessors still have a few thousand properties, we believe, to go on to the valuation rules. And simply, just because your rateable value is under 15,000, if you have other properties, you may not be eligible no, for a small business bonus. And we don't, it's that's not always apparent from the valuation rules. Yeah. Um, I can also correct my um, small business bonus cost. It's actually two, three, five million next year is the forecast cost. That was not bad. Uh, Ms. Barker, <laughs> that was quite close. Yes. Okay, that's helpful. I'll leave it there, conscious of time. Okay. Just before we take uh, Mr. Gibson for our final question in this area, and I'm sure members are primed to ask lots of questions on housing, can I just check something that I meant to ask at the start, which will help our budget scrutiny? There's always much debate over the local government um, uh, funding formula in terms of you know what monies go to which local authority and what quantities and what the methodologies used are. Um, as we know, and everyone talks about changing it, and then everyone says it's too difficult, let's leave it as it is. Has the Scottish Government made an assessment of how various ring fencing of priorities may have influenced the, o the overall direction of monies? I'll give an example. If you look at the bands multiplier, I'm delighted to hear that the, th those monies will now be redistributed in the normal way rather than retained by local authorities. I think. Personally, I think that's the right thing to do. You've got PEF monies going direct, direct to schools, but on a, a needs-based assessment, I think based on free school meals entitlement. So there's various monies going to local authorities now with slightly different distribution models. At some point, will the Scottish Government think about taking a step back, taking stock of that and seeing if that has maybe made a more progressive use of, of monies, a more targeted use of monies, or what the balance is? 
Uh, well, convener, your opening remarks about how it's so complex was so fair and accurate that most folk don't want to, to bother with the complexity of a whole sales systematic review of distribution and therefore don't want us to bother. I think 32 of out of 32 council leaders can come up with a formula that suits their council better, uh, but this is done through partnership with uh, local government. <coughs> Excuse me. There's a distribution and settlement group uh, where we engage with local authorities on how we're distributing new funds or how, if there's a proposal to change funds that we embark on that in a, a partnership fashion. Sometimes it's quite appropriate for funds to be specifically needs-based and then other times it might be proportionate and appropriate to just have a share on some other mechanism, whether it's population or whatever it happens to be. After you go through the distribution formula with all the various indicators in it, it arrives at a number that each local authority should get, and then I set what's called the floor, which essentially realigns and brings closer to a point of convergence. So all that work and debate takes you to a point where we still have ultimately convergence around what a council may actually uh, uh, receive, which is a matter for Scottish Government, not necessarily uh, local government. And that's why we engage through the circular, as proposed last week, on the local government settlement. Um, but there are no immediate plans to change the overall formula. I, if we uh, would uh, engage positively, if local authorities want me to do it, but Cosler would have to approach me, I suppose, and say, we want you to look at the formula again. Every time it's been tried, convener, I know you'll be very familiar with this, it just comes up with a lot of money spent on a lot of consultants, and each council argues for the position that suits it best, rural versus urban, uh, island versus mainland, east versus west, a deprivation versus super sparsity, I could go on, which ultimately means I have no great desire to revisit the overall distribution formula. Perhaps I, I, I didn't articulate the question the, the way I meant to, Cabinet Secretary. I, I'm suggesting that the, the variety of ring fencing, using different methodologies for giving monies to local authorities separate from how the revenue grant is distributed may have had an impact on how monies are directed to different parts of the country in a positive way, because we should be progressive and we should be redistributing. I'm just wondering if that will be looked at in the round at any point, Cabinet Secretary. We're always, uh, convener, I, I entirely get the point. Um, we always look at the outcomes for local authorities when we're allocating resources in a global picture as well. And sometimes it's very specific needs base or a, a, okay. a pot for a specific function. Uh, then they should spend it on that thing. And I, th I think a really good example of that would be the housing money, which you'll now come on to. A substantial uplift to invest in housing is a good example of where there's a specific need, a specific investment, and local authorities should get on and allocate and spend those resources with partners. And it will now be in Mr Gibson's hands whether we move on to housing at this point as part of his general theme of questioning. Questions, convener, thanks. But I mean, I want to go, okay, there's a couple of areas that haven't been covered, such as capital. OK, I think we should probably, I should probably, not us, I should probably apologise to the Minister in, in the scheduling of this session. We should have got the Minister to come in maybe an hour or so later. So my apologies for that, for, 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 for not identifying that as an, an opportunity to get your way through some, some other matters, Minister. Uh, Mr Gibson. Thanks very much, convener. Um, First of all, I would say that Labour Council Group leaders did, uh, three and a half years ago, try to look at a new funding model, but given it would have cost North Ayrshire £5.1 a year, it was simply abandoned, uh, understandably. In terms of small business bonus scheme, is it, is it not the case that although <coughs> one might talk about £235 million in revenue, uh, perhaps lost through supporting that scheme, that the Federation of Small Businesses said at the height of the recession, one in six small businesses would actually went bust uh, without... Um, the small business bonus scheme and therefore what it does is keep people in work and therefore helps the revenue streams of the Scottish Government? Yes, I do believe that is the case and it's certainly in the position of the Federation of Small Businesses who have said <coughs> that it has been a lifeline to many small businesses um, and ensures that we've got a competitive package of business rates relief. We've got to give people reasons to live, work and invest in Scotland. And uh, one, one example is a, a Paisley cafe that I visited when they uh, essentially went from paying business rates when we increased the thresholds for small business bonus, they didn't pay any business rates and how they used uh, that saving was to employ a, a new member of staff and she was delighted to be working there so many businesses use it to employ staff to invest in their premises but it has absolutely <coughs> been a lifeline during quite turbulent economic times. Uh, 
Okay, thank you. Now, you probably share my astonishment at the crocodile tears of the Conservative members on the committee about the uh, cuts uh, to local government. Uh, can you tell us what the difference, uh, the reduction in uh, local government uh, funding has been as a percentage in Scotland relative to England, where their party has been in power over the last decade? I'm using my memory here that it was roughly a, an equivalent analysis I had seen for a previous question about uh, in a comparable figure, uh, the level of reduction in real terms to English local authorities was about four, fivefold of any real terms reduction that Scottish authorities had faced. Okay, thank you for that. Now, in terms of the, the we talked at the beginning about the Her Majesty's Treasury deflator, and I'm just wondering, you know, how relevant is to actually use that deflator when we've got different circumstances here in Scotland? For example, the UK is not lifting the the one percent pay cap, but we've signalled that we actually are quite clearly. And it is it, so. Uh, that's a question I'd like to ask. But the follow up to that really is: is it appropriate to apply uh, the 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 um, um, Sorry, how will councils be able to deliver expectations on salary, um, given the disproportionate number of workers earning £30,000 or less? Um, so looking at the deflator uh, um, in terms of real inflation, which we know is 3%, and then how will councils be able to deliver the, sal the, the salary expectations, given the policy of no compulsory redundancies as well, which um, squeezes things somewhat for councils? I'm happy for Bill to return to the deflator uh, issue. Um, uh, but uh, from what I've seen and, and what I know of local authorities, uh, uh, they knew there would be um, a degree of pressure on them to uh, essentially move on pay. Now, what they do with the negotiations with trade unions will be a matter uh, for them. But I just put it in the context of uh, councils making efficiencies, uh, councils having a better settlement than they um, uh, expected. Uh, that I think they'll be able to, they'll be able to arrive at a, a fair settlement for their workforce, um, but I don't I don't um, set that. But I acknowledge that in the Scottish government lifting the pay cap creates a culture of expectation around what local authorities may be able to do as well. But it will be a matter for them, and I certainly think that they've got far more room for manoeuvre in a pay award than they would have done if they got a £300 million reduction, or let's take another scenario, if I had to find £501 million from frontline public services if I followed the Tories' tax plans. But that's not what I'm following, therefore the settlement for public services and local government is, is fair within that. So, on the deflator. On the deflator. Yeah. On the deflator point again, um, just to say that it's used by HM Treasury, <laughs> it's used by the Scottish Government finance, central finance, so it seems strange for the local government to use a different number. So, in, uh, just in the process of, of trying to, for clarification, uh, we use the same number so that everything can be looked at in, in the same light. Even though it doesn't reflect inflation, which is what, what we're actually dealing with. Uh, well, according to HM Treasury, it does. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> that's why I'm going to write to the convener with the, the explanation okay. of why, why they use it. So. And maybe, I use it. <laughs> to, make, to make a further helpful point, the Scottish Fiscal Commission is obviously um, strengthening its position and, and, and growing, <laughs> and maybe in the fullness of time they'll be able to provide more analysis and such matters. With mm -hmm. The way they build up their forecasts is built up from Scottish economic circumstances rather than top-down a perspective of what might be coming mm -hmm. from a, a UK level down, so maybe there's further analysis right. that would be helpful in future. Okay, Convener, it's a while since inflation has been 1.56%, but I'll just go on to capital because I realise you want to move into housing. I noticed that in the in the SPICE figures, the real terms um, change in, in the revenue settlement, um, thanks partly to the Tories' £211 million cut in the resource, it varies from a 0.1% reduction uh, in Midlothian to a 0.4% a reduction in Gail and Butte, and the average is 1.8 for Scotland. But in capital, things are quite different. I'm just wondering if you can <coughs> explain that. North Esther Council, my area, uh, an area where I'm pleased to see we don't have any independent schools, the capital reduction is some 94.2%, but in the borders, it's increasing by 40 Two percent. So there seems to be colossal differences in terms of next year's capital allocation, mm -hmm. whereas the revenue allocation is very steady. I'm just wondering why there are these huge variations across Scotland, in particular, obviously for North Ayrshire. Yeah, I'll, I'll let uh, the rest <coughs> come back. It's uh, <laughs> these huge swings that are to do with the flooding money, uh, and obviously, if, if a local authority doesn't spend <coughs> its flooding allocation in one year, it'll get it the next. Uh, and therefore there have been some, we go out to each local authority each year to ask them what they spent, 
what their plans are for the, the following year and we make adjustments. There's a, a figure of 42 million each year guaranteed for the flooding yeah. programme yeah. and we have to move that around uh, between the local authorities to ensure that all local authorities have got sufficient to be able to carry their programme forward. So there are some slippages, there are some overestimations. So in, in this case, um, yeah, North Ayrshire, uh, they, they've, they have sufficient money at the moment without giving them any ad additional from the flooding allocation mm -hmm. uh, into 1819. As long as you bear in mind that the Garnet Valley Flood Prevention um, programme is going to be coming forward for funding pretty soon. Thanks very much. <laughs> I think you've, you've, you've made your point. I suspect the Cabinet Secretary won't want to comment on that specific scheme. <laughs> That shameless bid for funding. <laughs> uh, absolutely, it always shows your <coughs> job. Right, we will move on to, to, to housing minister. So, so, yes, Mr. Whiteman, uh, you want to open up on housing? <coughs> yes, by all means. Uh, um, thanks very much. Um, important welcome resources for, for housing. Um, we, we um, I think we're looking a, a week or two back at comments that the First Minister had made during the SNP party conference about if you don't use all your allocation, we'll take it back, the balance, and give it to someone um, who can. Um, obviously, we've got ambitious housing targets. I'm just concerned that statements like that send the wrong signal to local authorities, some of whom may be facing quite challenges in assembling land and all the rest of it, maybe having to, to work over slightly longer timescales. Can you give us an assurance that, that the plans that each local authority has to deliver uh, housing can be delivered and there won't be any arbitrary clawing back of allocations? Uh, convener, um, I've made it very clear from uh, the start of all of this that if local authorities don't use resource, then we will recirculate the resource. Um, we have said to local authorities all along that they should build in slippage uh, to their plans uh, to ensure that they can maximise the amount uh, that's allocated to them in the resource planning assumption. Uh, but one of the things which I must ensure, um, convener, is the best use of the resource that is available to us uh, over the course of this parliament. Um, and, you know, there are certain uh, local authorities uh, who um, have been somewhat slower um, than others uh, to get things off the ground. Um, if they are unable to spend that resource, we will give it to authorities that are further along the way. However, um, as I've said previously to this committee convener, um, I uh, have a determination to ensure that this housing programme benefits uh, the whole of Scotland, rural, urban, highland, border, island. Uh, I want everyone to benefit. But um, local authorities themselves uh, need to ensure uh, that they are planning and they have uh, guarantees over the next three years, takes account of the money that's allocated to them and makes sure uh, that they are able to do that job of work to spend that money, which should include slippage, um, uh, just in case some things don't go to plan. Thank, thank you. Just two follow-up points from that. We had some evidence from uh, Alatro that they need to look again at how the Affordable Housing Investment Programme uh, works in particularly <coughs> remote and rural uh, communities about their kind of special needs. Um, and in light of what you've just said about uh, planning over the next three years, would you be open to where other parties to be willing, other political parties to be willing, uh, sending signals about a longer term commitments on funding beyond the lifetime of this parliament, which obviously you couldn't commit to on paper, but would be a political commitment that would allow some authorities who want to do planning on slightly longer time scales and have particular difficulties maybe with, with access to land in rural areas, etc., to be able to plan for delivery in four or five years' time? Um, in terms of moving on after this parliament, as Mr Whiteman knows, um, uh, the government itself kind of make those commitments. I'm willing to talk to all parties uh, about all issues as uh, members round the table uh, know. Um, so if, if Mr Whiteman and others want to talk to us about uh, the future, I'm, I'm more than willing to have those discussions. Uh, in terms of the Alacho comments uh, around about um, rural housing and housing um, for uh, special needs, um, first of all, in terms of rural and island housing, we've put in place the £25 million rural uh, housing fund and the £5 million uh, island housing fund, uh, recognising the differences that there are there. Um, in terms of the affordable housing programme itself, 
um, I have said to this committee and to uh, all stakeholders, you know, that there are uh, points where uh, we recognise that there needs to be flexibilities um, and that folks should talk to my uh, housing officials uh, on uh, the ground. Um, <coughs> it is uh, the case that um, in certain places, um, the subsidy uh, level available is not going to make the inroads that are required. Um, and we have recognised that. Uh, and that's why, you know, there has been additional uh, subsidy allowed for the likes of the new houses of a ferry um, off Mull, um, award winning of a ferry who uh, won in the first ever uh, Surf Housing Awards the other week. Uh, the same goes for other um, rural uh, and island, <coughs> island housings where we recognise um, that the, um, the, the subsidy that is provided is not going to do the business in those areas. My officials on the ground will continue to talk to folk around about those flexibilities. Uh, a lot will know that because they've heard me say that um, at the joint delivery group. Um, which they are members of. Um, in terms of uh, housing, particularly um, uh, housing for disabled people, convener, um, we've made uh, a clear, um, made it quite clear in a fairer Scotland for dis disabled people, um, our delivery plan, um, that we uh, will be flexible in our approach uh, in terms of housing delivery. I think I've said to this um, committee before, um, but I repeat it again, um, uh, if a project requires additional funding, uh, then we have the flexibility in place uh, to look at that. Um, convener, I should also say that um, all of that, uh, these builds in, in terms of, of uh, uh, housing uh, for special purposes, um, all of that should fit in with the local authorities' housing needs and demands assessment around about what the requirements for their area, <coughs> excuse me, convener, actually are. Um, what I would say um, to the committee is that over uh, the last period of time, um, I have uh, made a number of visits uh, throughout the country to look at housing. Uh, which uh, is wheelchair accessible and has made a huge difference to, to people's lives. Okay. Um, in places uh, like Dundee, Inverness, um, Glasgow, uh, and you know we will not uh, we will not stymie that by arguing uh, about um, subsidy. We will talk about the flexibilities okay, and making thanks. those homes a reality. Just, just one final very brief question <coughs> on, on, on the housing. Uh, there is an increase in the financial transactions funding <coughs> in this budget. I'm just wondering uh, what information you can provide about how any of that will be used for housing. I think we'll be able to provide more information uh, on uh, the... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Uh, in the uh, Scottish... Uh, Build fund uh, at the beginning uh, of next year. I turn to the cabinet secretary when, when uh, I, I, I answer that because obviously uh, it's his decisions round about that. But we um, mustn't lose sight of um, the <coughs> uh, capital that's been allocated to housing as traditional capital, sure. as people understand. It. It's a significant uplift for the resource planning assumptions, and that's what will help deliver the 50,000 houses. If financial transactions uh, may be able to assist where there has been um, help to buy schemes uh, or potentially uh, how I'm proposing to use some of it around uh, capitalising the National Investment Bank uh, or other or the Building Scotland Fund where there may be other ways we can support housing growth by using financial <coughs> transactions. But the 50,000 affordable homes target is being delivered by traditional yes, yes. capital. Convener, and just to repeat what I said in my opening statement, um, the affordable housing figure for this year is £756 million. Um, and that is part of the £1.754 billion pounds of resource planning assumptions that were given to local authorities over um, the past three years. As I said earlier that this gives them um, stability, um, and security around about planning over the piece uh, in order for them to help us uh, meet our target.
And he certainly didn't lose his voice when he was asking for the money. No, know? I certainly didn't lose my voice at that point, Camina. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay, Mr. Whiteman, um, <coughs> can I just, I mean, clearly, to me, in manifesto commitments, housing was always going to be the big winner. I mean, any any budget line that's got a 22% increase in budget is pretty spectacular. I'm, I think I'm just stating obvious in relation to that. So what we're actually scrutinising is not that budget line, it's the delivery is, is, is what we're scrutinising. Um, However, there is one part of the housing budget which is still pretty minimal, and that's in relation to adoptions, which I think, <coughs> I've really lost my notes, but I think that's a... Ten million ten, pounds. Ten million there. cash yep. flat settlement. Yep. And when you when you compare that to the mammoth budget for the affordable housing investment programme, and you look at health and social care integration funds sitting beside that, and we have heard stories of backlogs for adaptions needing to be done, you start to think there's got to be a more clever way of using that system because there should be more than that 10 million pounds available within existing resources, because if they're not, then the suggestion is we have to find more resources for that, I suppose. So what would the Minister's view be in relation to the huge budget for meeting uh, our, our joint housing ambitions, but a 10 million cash flat uh, settlement for adaptions? Uh, convener, the uh, Public Bodies Joint Working Act 2015 uh, de delegated powers and responsibilities and budgets in respect of adaptations um, to integrated joint boards. Um, and they have to uh, produce a housing contribution statement as part of their st strategic plans. Um, so the £10 million, uh, which uh, we have made available again this year for registered social landlords, um, is above uh, the monies that should be provided by integrated joint boards uh, in order uh, to provide the adaptations that people actually um, need. Uh, convener, um, the, as the committee is probably aware, um, we uh, put in place uh, an adaptations uh, working group um, which uh, looked um, at what, <coughs> excuse me, at what was going on um, in a number of areas across the country. Um, that uh, uh, the recommendations from that group um, have crossed my desk just recently, um, and I intend to meet my officials in the new year uh, to see how we can ensure um, that the recommendations uh, from that working group um, are uh, actually uh, rolled out. Um, and that work will include uh, work, work with senior staff within health and social care partnerships uh, on the preventative benefits. Uh, of investing in a, a well-functioning uh, and resourced adaptation uh, service. Uh, I think that they have got to recognise their responsibilities. Many integrated joint boards are doing well in this regard, others not so well, uh, but we are committed uh, to implementing uh, the recommendations of the Adaptations Working Group um, and the evaluation of the Adapting for Change test sites that I, I spoke about earlier. Um, and as I say, we have continued with that £10 million budget for registered social landlords uh, over the course of this year. Okay, that, that's helpful. Can, <coughs> can, 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 can I just check then last year, uh, would it have been assumed that integrated joint boards would hopefully have also made a contribution uh, to that particular budget line? And if that was the case, are figures available for what, if you were to multiply what the 32 joint boards put in, and we were, at it, we were to add it to that £10 million, what the national spend might be on adaptions. That might not be numbers. That I, I fully appreciate, Minister, that might not be numbers that are collected, but you'd understand why, as a committee, we'd be keen to get a hold of that kind of information to get a trend or pattern, and more importantly, see what the outcomes are with the spend uh, of that money. Convener, those are numbers that I don't have to hand. Um, I don't know how easy it would be to gather up those numbers from integrated joint boards. Uh, what I will do, um, uh, Convener, is I will attempt uh, to try and get those numbers for you and will write to, to the committee. But I, I would reiterate, um, you know, the Public uh, Bodies Joint Working Act 2015 passed the responsibility uh, over this to integrated joint boards. Um, we have put in a, 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 an amount of effort in terms of the work of the Adaptations Working Group 
and um, that uh, adapting for change test sites that we put in place. Um, I'm willing to share uh, all of that information with you, convener, and as I say, that I intend to meet with my <coughs> officials um, at the beginning of the new year um, to look at how we can improve um, uh, the, the work that's going on in integrated joint boards. I think that would be really, really helpful, Minister. <coughs> that might, I mean, I know there's a balance to be struck between getting the data to provide our committee to be able to scrutinise the spend on that and the bureaucracy created in collecting some of that data, and there's always a balance to be struck, I'm aware of that, but with £355 million in the draft budget going to integrate <coughs> into the joint board and just trying to track that, 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 that crossover between what is a £10 million adaptions budget direct from the Scottish Government, but what is actually other funds from the Scottish Government to integrate the joint boards, which there's an expectation will also be spent in the same area. I think our committee will be keen to track some of that information over time. I suspect the first couple of figures might, years might, outturns may not illuminate very much, but over time I think we'd, we'd get a sense of, of where things are going on that. So that would be helpful. Any information you could provide in that area, Minister, would would, would be greatly no, received. Okay, <coughs> thank you. Um, Graham Simpson. I'm kind of loath to ask Mr. Stewart another question. <laughs> um, oh, but, uh, I do. <laughs> You know, back with me. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, I, I just wanted to clarify something uh, from uh, earlier on, convener, uh, when uh, Mr. Gibson uh, accused myself and Alexander Stewart of shedding crocodile tears. I can assure can, Mr. Can, can, can Gibson I, that. Can, can, no, can, can I ask you to ask well, a question? I will question ask a question, question but our concern for the future of I, local I, government I, is I'm real. I'm sure, Mr. Simpson. When you were making your point about private schools greeting about tax breaks that are going away from them, there was other members in this committee who would like to have used pejorative language in relation to that area. We didn't. We said nothing. We gave you several questions to the Cabinet Secretary on that. Okay. Mr Gibson has been afforded the same privilege. Can I ask you to ask a question now, Mr Simpson? Yes, thought you might be uncomfortable with that, convener. Um, I'm uncomfortable is, um, with inconsistent cheering. I'm doing is, consistent um, cheering. Ask the question if you want to ask the one. The Scottish Government pledged to spend uh, more than half a billion pounds on energy efficiency um, over four years. Uh, so that would be an average of £125 million a year. Uh, but the current, current year spend is 114 million and the draft budget freezes that. So there seems to be a disconnect there to me between um, spending and commitment. And I wonder if you could explain why you've not increased it. Uh, Convener, um, our aim is to still spend uh, half a billion pounds over the four year period. Um, we have spent a billion pounds in energy efficiency um, since 2009, and I look to my left, 2009, am I right in that, <coughs> 2009 convener? Um, and as uh, Mr Simpson uh, is aware from answers that I gave to Mr Whiteman uh, last week, uh, we will lay out uh, uh, more detail on all of this uh, as we move forward with the... Um, as the Scotland, as we produce the Scotland's energy efficiency programme route map, um, and as we move on to the Warm Homes Bill, which will be introduced um, this year, um, we are on track to spend that half a billion pounds. Uh, we will have spent by the end of this Parliament a billion pounds in energy efficiency since two thousand and nine. <coughs> I'm not going to put Mr Stewart through any more uh, agony. Uh, You're very kind. Uh, okay, apparently Mr Gibson doesn't have the same qualms. Um, he's, he's made a bid for a question. Can I, can I ask other members to catch my eye if they also wish to ask questions? I know the Deputy Convener has got a couple as well. Thank, uh, you very, it, <coughs> thank you very much. I think Mr Stewart's paying the price of a nasty habit. Can I just ask one question, Mr Stewart? Um, COSLA have said that, uh, and I quote, we continue to have concerns around the difference in grant subsidy level available per unit to councils and RSLs. Overall, these levels currently stand at 57k per unit for councils and 70k per unit for RSLs. I'm just uh, wondering, um, if, given the, the, the huge increase in, in support for housing, where there's now room to actually provide additional funding to local authorities so that they can uh, um, get their get more of their own um, council housing plans on track? Uh, convener, I don't, um, <coughs> I don't intend to open up the can of worms uh, around about renegotiating um, subsidy levels. 
uh, these, uh, the levels were set at the beginning of 2016 uh, after much debate. That added some um, £14,000 per unit to the, to the subsidy at, at that point in time. And the reasoning for the um, differentials, as the committee um, is well aware, is that local authorities can borrow um, at much cheaper rates um, than housing a a associations can. Uh, so that is the reasoning for um, that differential. Uh, I think that if I were uh, to open up the can of worms of trying to renegotiate subsidy again, which I'm not, but if I did, um, you know, we would probably spend more time arguing um, about uh, what those subsidies that should be uh, rather than getting on with the job of delivering uh, houses across Scotland. Uh, as I've already explained to the committee, uh, on a number of issues, uh, I'm willing to be flexible uh, and my officials on the ground who uh, have uh, the most conversations uh, with local authorities and housing associations are aware that I want that flexibility to be in place. Those flexibilities, if we've uh, already gone over, include, uh, include some higher rates for uh, islands and very rural communities um, for uh, wheelchair accessible housing um, and for uh, housing uh, with uh, uh, much more bedrooms than average, uh, where, again, the, the, a need can be shown that that's necessary. Um, so rather than uh, open up a can of worms, I'd rather be flexible and have the constant discussion rather than a rammy about what new rates should be. Thank you. Excuse <coughs> me. OK. Uh, Alexander Stewart. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> very much welcome the increase in the housing budget money. I, I think that is uh, apparent from us all. Uh, but in the past, we have struggled at times to spend the full amount of money. Uh, in 15-16, I think there was a 16% a underspend of about 74 million. Uh, so can I maybe ask what the processes and procedures that are in place to ensure that as much of the housing budget uh, will be spent and, and that we try and avoid as much of the underspend as we can? Uh, convener, um, I will do everything possible to uh, spend every penny. I don't recognise the figure that Mr um, Stewart gave there in terms of um, last uh, year's um, uh, budget. Uh, what I would say is there was uh, some uh, of underspend, or uh, it was deemed to be underspend um, in last year's budget. Uh, the vast bulk of that was uh, actually receipts um, that we did not expect to get. Um, off the top of my head, I cannot remember exactly what the figure is around about those receipts. Um, if the committee is interested, I can pass that figure to you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> OK. Um, Elaine Smith. Thanks very much, convener, and thanks for your patient wait, uh, Minister. Can I just ask you, uh, it was a follow-up to the line of question the convener was uh, taking with you. Just a practical question. When um, we look at new house building by the private companies, then they're building in, they seem to be building into that the ability to adapt easily and relatively cheaply. And so a lot of the, the issues with adaptations at the moment is trying to adapt to existing housing stock that perhaps um, isn't is easily adapted. So the question would be, are you aware if with all of the new building that's going on and the welcome new building in both council and the, the, the rest of the public sector, are you aware if that is being taken on board that houses are being built to a standard that would be more easily adaptable in future? Convener, in terms of the affordable housing programme, uh, the last figure that I have uh, shows that 94% of the houses being delivered um, were classed as houses for varying need. In other words, housing that could be readily adaptable. Um, beyond that, convener, uh, Ms Smith mentioned um, the private sector. Um, and while um, building standards officials um, are particularly busy at this moment in time in light of the tragedy at Grenfell and Co and all of the work that we've gone on, uh, one of the things which they will be looking at, at the, in the near future, at my request, is uh, building standards uh, and it's the part it can play uh, in dealing with housing for varying needs uh, in the, the private sector. Um, the committee can be absolutely assured 
um, that I will continue to monitor all uh, of this very closely. 94% um, is a, a good figure as far as I'm concerned. I would like to drive that up um, further in terms of uh, meeting our ob obligations um, in terms of uh, the demographic change that is taking place and also um, our, uh, the obligations that we spell out in the Disability Action Plan. Uh, Ms Smith is uh, quite correct that uh, a number of uh, houses uh, are not easily adaptable. Um, but what I've found from my own constituency um, cases over the past while, where there's a will, there's a way sometimes in getting this absolutely right. Um, and I think that what we need to do um, is to make sure that common sense applies to a, a, a number of the things that are going on out there. Uh, and that's why, you know, um, we will look at what the Ad Adaptations Working Group recommendations say uh, and look at the tests that we've carried out in parts of the country to try and ensure that we get the best practice that's going on in certain places um, right across the board. Um, because, you know, I've, I've anecdotally had examples um, of, of folk living in very similar accommodation, um, but in different places where, in one case, it's been easy to adapt uh, and in another place where they've said it's not quite so easy to adapt. Thanks very much, Convener. And obviously, <coughs> the Minister knows that the committee have been taking a big interest in building standards recently. Um, a lot of time, I suppose, we've spent talking about the strand of disability with regard to housing. But I wonder if I could just ask you maybe to comment a bit further on the other equality considerations that have been taken into account in developing the housing budget. For example, look at age. Age doesn't just cover uh, older people, although important though that is, but it also covers younger people. So could I just ask for some general comments, Minister, on equality considerations in the housing section of the budget? Uh, well, the equality uh, assessment of the budget is presented in the equality budget state statement, uh, which has been published every year since 2009 alongside the Scottish draft budget itself. Um, and that's a systematic approach uh, in terms of assessing the equality impact of policy proposals um, and the impact that the, those proposals uh, have o on various groups. Uh, beyond that, Convener, um, in terms of the formulation um, of the local housing strategies, um, so housing needs and demand assessment flowing into the local housing strategy, flowing into the strategic uh, housing investment programme, that um, uh, local housing strategy aspect, uh, all local authorities should be looking uh, at the equalities impacts at, at that stage of, of the process. Beyond that, um, as the committee is uh, very well aware, um, I will be doing my now traditional uh, Christmas thing of looking at the strategic housing uh, investment programmes over the course of these holidays. Um, they were delivered to my desk uh, last night. He knows how um, to I know how to live. I'm going to have chocolate and strategic housing investment programmes, convener. Um, and I will be going through them, as I did last year, with a fine tooth comb uh, to look uh, exactly at uh, what is, has been taken into account in terms of uh, needs of disabled people in uh, those strategic housing investment plans. Um, the, I think the latest figure um, that I have seen is that <coughs> some 12% of uh, new starts um, are uh, housing uh, for special needs. I will clarify um, that figure in writing uh, to the committee because that is off the top of my head. But if, uh, if, if memory serves me well, that's 12%, but I will, I will send that detail on to the committee. Thank you, Minister, and I'm sure the committee will look forward to hearing from you in due course about your deliberations over the festive break. Could I just ask the Cabinet Secretary actually a similar question? Uh, the Minister commented on how the quality impact assessment is produced every year for the draft budget. So could I ask um, Derek Mackay the, a similar question about the, this year's statement, but also given it's produced every year, do you have any comment on the on areas that have been identified where improvements have had to be made over the years with the impact assessment? 
I think <clears throat> that part of it is in relation to the engagement that I have building up to the budget, that, that that's important, and also analysing our policies. What difference can it make? How is it addressing equalities? And um, if I can give you just a, one a example beyond the equalities um, a budget statement, it's in determining our tax proposition, we thought about what, what was that, what does that mean by way of a uh, progressivity, inequality, uh, gender as well. Um, more women are lower paid than men, for example. So all of that then features in the decisions we've taken. And taxes, uh, income tax, of course, is such a big fiscal lever uh, that it was right that we look at the impacts on households and the um, categorisation within <coughs> that to understand the impact of our decisions. And that good practice all stems back from an approach on equalities budgeting, uh, what's the difference of investment we're making, uh, what's the intended consequences, what might be the unintended consequences. And it's now a range of uh, good um, uh, engagement uh, and also essentially analysing what our policies uh, can do has got us into a place that I, I think government and officials, for that matter, think about impacts in a more <coughs> um, a, a holistic a way. But I just say that good practice, that approach on um, investment of expenditure is significant, and also how we raise revenue as well. We absolutely um, had that as a key plank of our thinking in income tax. So I use that as a live, current, um, example of how we've uh, deployed um, uh, thinking on decisions that we make. Okay, thank you. Okay, any more questions? Okay, there are no bids for questions. Um, can I, can, I suppose I should say, first of all, Minister, thank you for persevering through uh, the lurgy. Uh, I think the, we've the, both the, got the lurgy, but we've survived. That, that is afflicting you. Nothing gets me to Christmas, but knowing that you are reading 32 different strategic housing investment plans from local authorities. So thank you for getting all of us in the festive spirit, <laughs> Minister. Uh, but thank you to both yourself and the Cabinet Secretary and your wider team for the evidence this morning. If there's any additional information you want to provide, we would appreciate that in helping us do our, our budget scrutiny deliberations. So thank you, everyone. That ends this agenda item. And we'll suspend briefly before we move to the next agenda item. Thank you.
We now move to agenda item three, which is common good property and funds. And the committee will take evidence from Craig Veach, Aberdeen City Council, Andrew Ferguson, Fife Council, and the Society of Local Authority Lawyers and Administrators in Scotland. Dr. Lindsay Neal, former chair, Selkirk and District Community Council, and Paul Nevin, um, who is appearing uh, in behalf of Alison Mc McGeechan. I apologise if I pronounced that wrong. Uh, Paul worked very closely with Alistair in relation to written evidence that's been submitted, so thank you very much for coming along to give evidence to us today. I believe everyone's got some short opening remarks um, to make, so I don't know if we just go from my left to right. Mr Veach, do you want to, to go first? Okay, hello everyone. It's, I'm Craig Veach. I'm the property team le leader within legal services at Aberdeen City Council. I'm actually relatively new to Common Good and, and all the other aspects, um, as I only joined a local authority from private practice and an oil and gas history as well uh, uh, in uh, February 2016. Um, so suffice to say, it's, it, it's certainly been a hot topic since I, since I joined. It's something that um, in any of our client, client services in relation to land and property assets, um, it's a key question if they are looking to sell or uh, sell or, or lease an asset. Is 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 this going to be subject to common good? So, you know, it's an integral part of what what myself and my team of of, of five solicitors and three paralegals have to do deal with on generally a day to day basis. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to to listening to and and contributing to today's discussion. Thank you very much. Mr Ferguson? Um, thanks, uh, Convener. In the interest of speed, I have nothing really to add. I'm happy just to take questions. Oh, no, that's my kind of opening statement. No, <laughs> no pressure, Dr Neil. No, none at all. No. <laughs> Thank you very much. I will be brief. I hope to be able to illuminate further the question of ownership of common good and suggest practical measures whereby that can be achieved easily. Secondly, the, uh, I've always wanted to democratise the common good and restore to the community some control over their common good. And that, I would be willing to answer questions on that one, of course. And I should just add that I'm here representing uh, William Telfer, Bill Telfer, uh, who couldn't be here today, and I know what he, was, what he would want to say. <coughs> And the only other thing is that a question that hasn't really been addressed is um, whether local authorities should be charging common good funds for the work that they do, which is governed by the 1973 Local Government Act. So that's all I will illuminate on any of those questions. Thank you. OK, I'm, um, I'm hoping members are listening and scribbling notes and those very specific points you've made there, Dr Neil Pony. <coughs> Thank you, Convener. As you said, I'm appearing for Alistair McKechn, who's, uh, whose submission was in his private capacity. So I'm also representing his view because I work very closely with him in the area of common good. been with the local authority for over 10 years. Um, I'm happy to give my own personal view, what I believe to be the view of our members as I see it, what I believe the Murray local public's view is, all three of which are sometimes at odds with each other, and uh, three possible options for change of common good going forward. Thank you very much, everyone, and absolutely on the money, brief statement, so that's very, very appreciated. And we'll move to our first question, which is Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks, convener, and thanks to you all for coming in this morning. Um, I mean, obviously, common good is a long-standing issue. I think it was first raised in Parliament in the first year of its Parliament's existence, and has had limited but ad hoc attention um, since then. Uh, so, I mean, I think the committee is very grateful for all the written evidence that's come in. We, um, just with timing and scheduling, we haven't been able to get round to an oral session to, to, to deal with that until uh, just now. Um, but I suppose what I'm keen to hear from you, um, and you don't all need to contribute on this if you don't um, wish to, because there will be further questions, is you know, what are the key issues around the legal framework surrounding common good in terms of its ownership and administration that you think uh, Parliament should uh, pay some uh, attention to. Um, and give some idea about the kind of consequences of the legal framework as it stands just now, uh, which are less than optimal. So the current legal framework? Is it fit for purpose, right. I suppose, is my question. 
I saw a flash of eye contact with Mr Nevin there, so let, let's take you first. Well, I think the, the current legal framework creates a special status for this small area of property and funds, which represents less than 1%, loosely speaking, of council assets. And the legal framework has led to a disproportionately complicated administration of common good assets in that the cost of administrating them generally far outweighs <coughs> excuse me, the value of the asset is being dealt with. If you compare it, to, for example, to leasing industrial premises, the amount of legal time and uh, resources, council resources used to do that is quite small compared to the value of the rental income, for example. When you deal with a common good asset, often a small parcel of ground, the resources to go into identifying it, you know, whether it's alienable or whether it's inalienable, all of those legal issues that are very difficult and time-consuming um, are disproportionate to the value of the transaction. That, of course, does not take account of the value placed on it by the inhabitants of the former boroughs who see more than economic value. They see local historical interest and all reputational things that... Uh, perhaps don't have a monetary value. Anyone else want to comment in this area? Uh, don't feel under pressure to it, Dr Neil. Yes, okay, I yes. Um, I think there's an awful lot of time wasted on trying to decide what constitutes common good property and what does not. And if I can remind you of what I said in my written submission, there was a very clear court case in 2003 involving the Wilson <coughs> against Inverclyde Council when three uh, judges at the inner house of the Court of Session made very clear judgments based on what had been said in a 1944 case that Mr Ferguson will be familiar with because it's mentioned in his book. And it is so clear in its judgment, which they all agreed on, that you don't have to haver and fight about what is common good and what isn't. There are going to be some exceptions, and what I would propose to try and uh, sort them out is a greater involvement of local people in the management of a local common good, and these uh, questions could be argued, discussed and decided at a much lower level than involving the entire council and all its staff and whatnot in expensive um, chasing of documents in one thing or another. Okay, thank you. Mr Ferguson, you. did you want to add? Um, yes, thank you, convener. I mean, I, th I think I'm broadly in agreement with, with uh, uh, Dr Neil and uh, Mr Nevin on this. Um, as uh, Mr Whiteman says, um, this common good issues come up again and again. It does involve a disproportionate amount of time. And I think um, in terms of definitions, as I say in my submission, um, there are two issues. One is what is and what isn't common good, as, as Dr Neil said. The other one is this very um, abstruse and academic um, definition around what's alienable, what's not alienable. Um, and that matters because it means the local authority has to go to court or doesn't have to go, go to court. So I've, I've put in some recommendations in my submission for basically doing away with the second of those definitions so that there should be a simple, transparent process for when local authorities want to do something. It's about consultation. It's about involvement with um, the local community, but making that simple and straightforward um, so that everybody's clear um, how uh, these properties can be dealt with um, and really just, I, I know what Dr Neil says about the, the, the case law, but the problem is that the, the case law is always capable of great interpretation and, and, and uh, you know, great fun for lawyers, but actually doesn't move things forward um, that, that much. So um, I think um, in terms of the consequence of the current legal framework is not perfect, I think probably some straightforward legislation, putting in a definition, putting in a simplified disposal process which involves proper consultation um, might be the way forward um, because at the moment it does take up a disproportionate amount of time and obviously you spent some time 
um, in, in relation to finance this morning and local government finance, um, the areas where um, which deal with common good in local authorities are the back office functions, and we all know what happens to back office functions in the current budget climate. They get squeezed more than the frontline services, so um, it's not as if the resources to deal with these types of issues are growing. Okay, Mr Feech, again, don't feel obliged to add to that. If you feel it's been suitably covered, that's OK. Do you want to add anything? Um, yeah, I'd just like to add, um, I always try to look at things from the perspective of, obviously, in working at local, at local authority, the, the, the people that we serve, and also our client services as well. They're looking to, to run run and, and, and deal with and manage the assets as best they can. Um, and just to reiterate, um, my colleagues, um, or Dr Neil, Mr Nevin and Mr Ferguson, there's now been a raft of case law, um, lots of lots of judicial or, or, you know, commentary on 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 the on the, the the previous law, and and I think this is maybe a great a great opportunity to to try and codify uh, um, uh, several of the judicial authorities, um, and as I say, and to include it within the the community empowerment related legislation as we're talking about and the consultation of, of the community bodies as and when we decide whether to alienate common good land. So if we have all everything all ready in a row, like what is common good and, and that's that's on, in the statute book and then how it can be disposed of and then linking it to the consultation that we're we're trying to introduce through the, the new nineteen uh, two thousand and fifteen Act then all that would be a great a great step forward. Okay. Mr. Whiteman, want to follow up on some of that? Uh, thanks very much indeed for that. I mean, we, we've got the Law Society of Scotland um, basically says, in response to the question about whether the rules which define common good are adequate, they, they, they basically say no. Um, Alastair McKechn, um evidence uh, no as well. Uh, there's an interesting comment from uh, Neil King, who I understand is a retired um, solicitor, and he said, I can't emphasise strongly enough that merely codifying the common rules in statute won't make the uncertainties go away. Um, because we still need to investigate every case on its merits, and it's that that's often quite challenging, and indeed leaves um, a lot of land just lying there abandoned and not being used because people can never get around to it. Uh, and on the flip side of that, uh, ties up a lot of time, even here in Parliament with the Portobello School Bill that went through last year, that was as a consequence of a dispute raised by residents who claimed the land was common good. City of Edinburgh Council accepted that it was common good, um, that question was never put to a court. I suggest that had it been put to a court, they'd have probably found it wasn't. <coughs> Nevertheless, this parliament had to go to an awful lot of bother passing a specific piece of legislation just to allow a school to be made. So Neil King goes on to say that he says the only way to make these problems go away is to have a definitive register. In other words, the definition of what is, what is and what isn't common good is based on case law, but in statute becomes whether it's in a register or not. And obviously there'd need to be some time allowed to make sure that everything that people wanted to get on was on, but at a certain point in time, if it wasn't on it, that by statute would not be common good. I mean, is that the kind of, because I know there's various solutions suggested in here, would that be the kind of approach that might help clarity in the future? Sure. Uh, okay, Mr Nevin first, then Dr Neil. That doesn't uh, form the basis of basis of Mr. McKagan's submission that I'm talking to, but I did read the submission, and I think it's an excellent idea, because as you say, to codify, to de define, as Mr. Vetch had said, to codify a definition of common good doesn't solve the problem. There's still going to be argument. So if you have a code that says if it wasn't bought for a statutory purpose, it isn't in a trust, and it was formerly owned by a borough council, then it will be common good. That, that might be your definition, but you then have to evidence that, as you say, and that's where the difficulty is. If you have a register and an end date to a register, if it's on, it's common good. If it's not on, it's not common good. End of story. That, that is your solution, or certainly a solution. But getting to the point that that register is complete will have involved lots of cases with the land tribunal, etc., etc. There will be cost and time. I think Mr. King suggests 10 years until it's closed. But then again, we recognise that completing the Land Register of Scotland is going to take 10 years. So 10 years is a short time when you consider how long this has been a problem. I think it's certainly, it's not one of the solutions that I would talk to, but it certainly would be a solution. 
whether it would be accepted by the public, because uh, there will be ongoing argument, you know, but, but if there was an end date, it, it could definitely work. Okay, Dr. Neil. Thank you. Um, yes, I agree with that. We should have a register. And there should be a sufficient time, 10 years, 5 years, whatever, for that to be compiled. But to use as the basis the inner house ruling is the start point. And anything that falls <coughs> outside or is in dispute could be disposed of at a local level, which is why I um, advocate increasing the number of local people involved in the common good administration. And you would get free people, <laughs> free service from them. And it wouldn't cost the cost as it does today in investigating <coughs> these things. We've done it in Selkirk already, and it worked. Okay, so get a register, have a cut-off date. How do other witnesses feel about that? I mean, I, I, I suppose it, it, having a register will help, and the consultation terms of the 2015 Act um, will help in thrashing out some of the, the arguments that, that people have about particular properties. Um, I suppose, in the end of the day, a, a judgment call will have to be taken on some properties, and it's really whether um, there's then an acceptance that, well, that's the, that's the decision and, and we can move on, or whether it just goes round in a big circle and, and starts again. I mean, I, I, one thing I was going to say was the community, community empowerment legislation um, is a great opportunity for communities to, to take things on. Um, and I suppose, um, maybe say this coming from Glenrothes rather than uh, an, an old borough, but there, there are these um, issues about the way councils use assets more widely, and I think the community empowerment legislation will help to, to tackle some of that. And uh, I wouldn't want common good to be end up being shunted into a corner of that, because it, it's obviously people have strong feelings about common good property and, and are proud of the, the borough's heritage, but it's not the, it's not the complete picture. So, Mr. Victor, we left with cut-off dates then has been the big issue rather than the register, because that's going to happen. It's the combination of the register that if it's not done in two, three years, whatever you, you d d dictate, then that is the register yeah. fixed but, then. But I suppose, Dr. Neil, uh, apologies, Mr. Whiteman, there, there's a general principle. We could say 30 years and 29 years and six months' time, there'll still be chunks of land out there people are disputing over. It's, what, it's the principle of a cut-off date, irrespective of when it's set. And that there appears, I'm just trying to get a sense uh, from the witnesses whether <coughs> if everyone accepts that there should be a cut off date. So, so I'll, take, I'll take Mr. Veach first. Sorry, I'll take Mr. Veach first. Yeah, I think it, with, with it, all of these things, if you don't set cut off dates, then it just rolls on and on, and, and there's, no, there's no focus and no targets. So I do agree with that principle. Uh, what I don't, what is difficult is that. Um, especially for the larger local authorities, such as Aberdeen City, we have, we have um, several thousand individual titles that would have to be examined. Uh, okay, some will be obviously common good, but there are others which you know you have to delve into not only the title deeds but um, <coughs> lo uh, council minutes from the 1800s, 1900s. Um, check with archivists, and to do that with with relatively slim slim legal team with a slim legal team in the face of the current um, budget restrictions and, and, and resource c and cost cutting that's going on through all the local authorities, um, putting an putting a early target date will make it extremely difficult for a number of the authorities to, to realistically achieve that target. This is also, I know this is a different topic, but the, the completion of the land register, there's already pressure from the government, government for public land to be registered by 2019. So adding a further burden of a common good register is is going to, you know, it's it's going to put even more strain on, on our our authority and our our departments. Now that's obviously time scale and resources. Before other witnesses come in, I'm conscious this is Mr. Whiteman's line of questioning. So maybe just pass it back to Mr. Whiteman. Then you yeah. come in and Okay, just one final points. question for our colleagues, and that's the question about kind of management. Uh, Dr. Neil, you talked about what's going on in Selkirk. I mean, in general terms. Given that the, the 1973 Act provisions were put in place to protect common good at the under, under um, uh, in response to pressure from town councils who wanted some protection for these assets and, and got those in the 73 Act, 
Um, do you think in general terms there's a case for allowing local communities to regain ownership of these assets uh, if they so wish? And on the specific point of the community empowerment, we, we do have a problem with, for example, the asset transfer provisions, which allow asset transfer requests to be made. But there's at least two authorities I know uh, where those asset transfer discussions have begun, where it relates to common good property, and they've said, well, you know, we're going to have to go to the court. So in other words, the Community Empowerment Act is not helping, um, or rather common good law is getting in the way of the intent of that particular provision of the Community Empowerment Act. Um, if I could respond to that, I think if it's devolved to a local area, you're going to get people volunteering to help with the established councillors and between them, they can sort out what is common good and what isn't. If they don't agree, then presumably it falls back into the council hands. But in that way, with a cut-out date, um, you will get a, a register. And if people don't make a case for it to be common good during that time, with the input of equal numbers of uh, elected councillors and local people, so that nobody can bulldoze anybody else, then that's it. You get the register done, end of story. Uh, let's see Mr Fergus and then we'll go to Mr Lee. So just very quickly, just uh, to endorse Mr Whiteman's comment about the asset transfer request. Yes, that is a, a point that I picked up in, the, in, in my submission, I think. Um, if you are going to legislate in common good, that would be something I would do to, to just tie the two together so that there's no doubt if there is an asset transfer request, you don't then have to go through the provisions of Section 75 of the 73 Act. Uh, Mr. Mr. Levin, I think, wants to come in as well. I was going to come back to your uh, first thing. Convening your point about the end, the close date for the register, I entirely agree there should be a date. However, it, it's that's not just what you were saying, I believe, Mr. Whiteman. You were talking about whether that list is a definitive legal definition of what is and isn't is and isn't common good and I would agree it would be a more useful register if it was and to turn to your comments regarding local um, local management of common good that would be what I would say is the second in my own personal view the second choice solution a good solution to uh, transfer to local trusts or to community councils or to people with local knowledge the disadvantage of that of course remains what are you transferring what is the common good that you're transferring? You're still stuck with the whole, what is common good? Okay, Mr. Stewart. Thank you. Uh, you've, uh, can we now, you've, you've already talked about the financial burdens that are faced with local authorities uh, in keeping the records of common good. Uh, and then we've also then touched on the uh, Community Empowerment Act. Uh, but do you believe that the Community Empowerment Act will give that help and guidance uh, in improving record keeping? Uh, and do we st still maintain that the financial burden is going to be quite heavy for the council and local authority? Mr Ferguson? I think the, 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 um, the provisions of the Act um, in setting up a register are perfectly sound and they're, they're, they're there to be done. Um, you've heard from my local authority colleagues, it will be a big job to do. Once it's done, it shouldn't be that difficult, but they're, they're, it, having Fife having gone through that um, on, on a kind of voluntary basis before, it is a massive input of resources at the start. Keep, once it's there, it's not huge, but there, there is a big lump of work to be done. And, and, and because of the, the constraints that are facing, do you believe that that is reasonable to expect them to do all that? Uh, or, or will they put it to the back burner because it's not seen as a major priority? I, th I think the issue is time scale. How, how long are you going to give us to, to do it, frankly? Yep. OK. Um, a couple of questions myself. Other members have got questions if they could indicate to myself. But can, can I just ask how you anticipate councils will, will do this? Because the one way is, is to have a 10 years time, have a cut-off date. But local authority, I assume, will, will trawl through assets that the council owns that they suspect actually in practice is, is common good lands and properties uh, so uh, as they as they go through an area by definition of not putting some land in a, on a common good register they're effectively saying that's not common good that can be done before an artificial cut-off date so is there a potential phased approach to this by local authorities where 
different geographical zones of each local <coughs> authority could be, um, if you like, zoned as we'll track this zone next, work out what should or shouldn't be common good, transfer everything into a common good register that they see as appropriate, and then at that point it's deemed everything else within uh, that area would not be common good. Do we have to do this in a kind of big bang cut off date for 10 years time, or could we do this incrementally? Just a thought. It could Dr. be done Neil. incrementally, but uh, in order to simplify the whole process and avoid further argument, discussion, and so on, if you do it in a manner of having a cut off date and involvement of local people, a lot of the administrative work will be absolved or uh, unnecessary because local people will then have had an opportunity to claim what is common good. And if it isn't on the register at the end of that time period, then it doesn't belong to the common good. End of story. That's what I'm trying to get across. OK, no, that's a fair point, Mr Nevin. I think your suggestion is a good one. I think a phased approach you could perhaps take. We all know within our local authority areas, we've got, I think in the case of Murray, we've got 11 former boroughs. boroughs. Hard for an ordinary Irish man to say that word, actually. Um, and we know that some have got more common good than others. We already know this. And so if you did a phased approach, you could take a former borough area, say for six months or one year, and that way the, the convener suge your suggestion convener would make it more bite-sized and you'd perhaps have a better focus and it would be more manageable and less likely to get put on the, we don't have to do this for another nine years, let's leave it until the tenth year before we start. And then come to successor <coughs> committee and tell them we don't have enough time, resources or yes. expertise in the local yes. authority area to deliver it, which would maybe be my my concern. One of the requirements uh, would be good quality community consultation because you can decide as a local authority that land is or isn't common good, whatever that set process would be, which would involve community engagement. But you know, in some areas, community councils are a lot more vibrant and active than other areas. There are natural campaigners in some communities, but not in other communities. Um, where is the incentive for local authorities to do uh, really good quality community engagement? And what should that look like? And the flip might be, is there a self-interest for some local authorities to have some lands not appear in the Common Good Register? And if there's a conflict there, how could that be resolved? This is not my area, so if that question doesn't stack up, my apologies, just having looked at the, the papers before me, Dr Neil. There, there is still a residual knowledge within communities as to what belongs to the common good and what doesn't. And if there were things that were questioned, they could be looked at. Um, I think the point being that um, you know, if things do not get questioned and the deadline <coughs> occurs, then fair enough, it's not common good. Okay, but where the, I suppose, but where there is no, I, I mean, something could be set in common good. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, Glen Conor, I don't know if it's common good, Glen Conor, Glen Conor Park in, in, in my constituency, where I, I think that the hold that the Friends of Glen Conor Park has over that and trust to the city lapses this year, and I think it will revert back to the city to have wider developmental plans. We've got a local regeneration group there that is quite focused on what that land should or shouldn't be used for and will be very attentive to that. There's local housing associations, there's a variety of others, but there'll be lands elsewhere where that skill set just doesn't exist or it's uh, decades later, it's a distant memory for, for most people what land was or wasn't used for. It's how do we ensure local authorities are in proper community engagement in relation to that? Because something can be held in common good, but community may be completely unaware of it. It may not be on their radar. So any more thoughts on how we do that community engagement? Mr Ferguson. No, so, uh, um, I think, I mean, there, there is a, a, a really positive outcome for local authorities consulting properly with the, the local communities and because as, uh, I totally agree with Dr Neil, um, particularly in the bigger local authorities um, the, 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 with the changeover of staff over the years and everything else nobody knows their, their own local area. In fact there are 26 former boroughs um, and um, even if you've been as long in local authority as, as I have it's, it's often only a particular area 
um, of um, Central Fife in my case that, that you know quite well, whereas the people in the local communities generally do have a lot of the history and so on. So there can be really positive out outcomes um, from consulting properly. I, I'm not quite sure, obviously, guidance can help us with how you should carry out a consultation. There's an awful lot of um, work being done on, on what a good consultation would, would look like in, in other contexts. So I don't think that in itself um, should be that difficult. I think that the, the case you mentioned, there are other cases where um, a community has strong feelings about a particular asset. Common good is sometimes part of the, the answer or, or the equation, but um, it, the, the community empowerment um, powers now give communities greater power to, to uh, take things into their own hands if that's what they want to do. So I think, it, again, it's, it's part of a wider um, landscape. OK, thank you. Dr Neil. Yes, I was only going to remind those who don't know that in 1907, I think it was Lloyd George, <laughs> uh, went through every property in the land and assigned ownership to it. And one can find maps of these things. Um, if one can get them from West Register House. And you can actually track what was once upon a time common good. So you're not going to suddenly emerge with things that are not on that map. We've done a good proportion of this, and it can be done elsewhere. So you've got a point in time when common good property can be identified. OK, any other comments or thoughts on, on that, Mr Nevin? Yes, convener. I think you, you asked a question I don't know if we answered. Was, it, was there any advantage to a local authority not finding an asset to be common good? And I think the honest answer has to be yes. Because if we find an asset is common good, particularly if it's inalienable common good, then we have to go to the court to change its use or to sell it. And also, if we do sell it, we being the council, that money, the proceeds, the free proceeds, must go into a common good account with the special status that that holds and not into general coffers. I would hope, however, that local authority lawyers who deal with the definitions of common good are not working on that basis. But there would be... I don't... It would be advantageous to the council if it wasn't common good. And in terms of the consultation, I think you've got a difficulty because you have, as you said yourself, you've got some borough councils, borough council areas that have got very involved inhabitants who know lots about the local history and are very interested in common good and would engage in consultation. You've got others who don't, and as you say, the common good could be missed. So perhaps as part of a consultation, you actually have to start with education in those boroughs to raise the awareness in those boroughs of what common good is and could be in that particular area before you hope to get buy-in, so, you know, meaningful buy-in to a consultation. And I suspect that's where the tension comes from, and I don't mean this in a bad way to local authorities, but once you raise that awareness, you create a a demand and an aspiration and a bureaucracy and a time consumption for local authorities to manage all of that. If you've got uh, no one really responding to a statutory consultation period, but then you, you, you leaf that whole area, you knock a few doors, you get a public meeting and 20 folk come along, you effectively then get community activism that might mean challenge some of the actions of the local authority. So it's just where the incentive and disincentive sit in, 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 in relation to that. Um, I'm not seeing, I mean, I'm, I'll, I'll continue to ask questions, but I'm not seeing any bids from members to ask questions. I'll take Elaine Smith and then Andy Whiteman. Thanks very much, convener. Excuse me. <coughs> it's actually a specific question for Mr Ferguson. Apologise, I seem to have lost my voice. Um, in your, your <coughs> submission, you talk about disposal, and it's something that Mr Nevin just mentioned there about, I suppose, about disputes. And you say that actually um, it could be it could be a, a simpler procedure, I think, is, is what you're getting at, and one of those could be for a land tribunal. Could you just expand a bit more on that for us, please? Thank you. Um, yes, <coughs> in terms of disposal, um, at the moment, um, either a council decides it's not that part of the common good which needs court approval, in which case it goes through the usual internal um, either committee or delegated um, processes and the, the properties disposed of. Um, there is obviously still a con uh, an obligation to consult with the community, but it's fairly straightforward. If not, then um, at the moment there's uh, the option of either going to the sheriff 
or going to the court of session, and I, I mentioned in my dis submission the pros and cons of, of that. Neither of them are really um, that accessible for the communities, um, unless, uh, uh, just as, as uh, the convener said, they are a thoroughly organised and, and focused um, community group that uh, are, are used to taking on these kind of things. But um, So, uh, to my view, really the issues, um, the, the legal issue, if such a case does come up, are, are pretty straightforward. It's what's in the best interest of the community. That's what it comes down to. And I don't really see why that needs um, a highly paid sheriff even to, to decide that. Um, and if there was a lower tribunal um, which could deal with that and deal with it more efficiently, then um, I would have thought it's in best, the best interests of uh, both the community and the, and the council, really, um, just to try okay. and de-legalise yep. de it a bit. I wonder if any of the rest of the panel have a few on that. Hey, Mr Beach. Yeah, the Aberdeen City Council is currently um, considering a court petition in relation to um, property at Union Terrace Gardens. Um, it's obviously the, the, at the heart of the city centre, and th clearly the, the proposals that they intend have been um, widely. It's, it's already gone through full council and approvals been made to go ahead, but um, we have had to spend several thousand pounds on a court uh, council opinion just to confirm that we should go for a petition, and then we're going to have to do do all the petition work when it's clearly going to benefit the citizens of Aberdeen. What what is being proposed and it's. Um, it's, it's going to involve a, a lease of part of the of the recreational ground for um, basically coffee shops and, and retail. So it's going to benefit the community. It's unlikely that, uh, I mean, as, as um, Mr Ferguson is saying, do we have to have a highly paid sheriff to decide on what, what should just be common sense? So I would just uh, confirm or support what Mr Ferguson has said. Okay. Mr Nevin, did you like to add? At the risk of keeping common good complicated, I would say that we'd have to reflect uh, a recent experience we've had in Murray Council where we applied to the court, the Sheriff Court, to release inalienable common good, in this case a form of borough chambers, which are really special common good, and it was pretty painless. It was a summary application to the Sheriff, it was dealt with quickly. I think it was done well because there was a very, very good consultation and there were no objections. So, so much as I would like to see it not having to go to the Sheriff Court, there are experiences where it's pretty straightforward. It's not that hard. Okay. Dr. Neil, did you want to add something? I was going, only going to add, you, you mentioned you know, where you base this thing, on the community council or what. Now, community councils are generally attended by the local elected district or councillors for the area. And it would be a simple thing of tacking a management <coughs> committee onto the end of a community council meeting. It would not involve additional staff of the local authority. So I, you know, I do not foresee that there are big expenses involved and staff costs um, in order to carry out a democratization of the common good back to a local area. Could I pick up, could I just pick up uh, that point with Mr Neil? Because the other issue that I was interested that you raise um, and to do with legalities as well, is the issue of the, the live borders. I wonder if you could, t which which I think you're saying um, that, that there are no local people from the borough on this live borders. So maybe you could talk us through yes, that. Yes, the management of um, Common Good Fund um, should be done by people from the local area, either councillors or whatever. <coughs> the live borders is is a separate organisation which is not governed by common good law and there are no representatives or there are not defined representatives from each area of the common good that they have taken over. They haven't taken over the whole common good, they've just taken over parts of it. It's a mishmash and it does not conform with what the original uh, dictats of the common good law were, particularly the old 1491, 81 one. Which is delightfully simple. Thank you. Uh, our deputy could be an expert on the 1491 <laughs> common good law, but we won't press her further because she'll only get embarrassed. And Mr Whiteman, do you want to follow up on some of that? Yeah, just following those questions, I mean, obviously in the borders you have a tradition of 
common ridings and all the rest of it, and you have quite some large areas of land held in the common good. And um, in Selkirk, you've done a lot of work improving the administration and management of the common good. But obviously, in, in, in Edinburgh, Glasgow, Aberdeen, these are big cities. I'm just wondering how uh, management could be placed in the hands of local people when, in effect, in the city of Edinburgh, for example, local people are represented by one council. Um, I mean, you don't have Selkirk Town Council anymore, so naturally there's a sense in which you want to take back control, if you like, um, to Selkirk, rather, leave it as the, as the bigger entity. So I just wonder if you have any comments on how we might improve the administration in the cities, which still do have a, un a unitary authority. They have localised community councils, don't they, in Edinburgh? Uh, yes, I mean, there are probably about 20 or so well, local you know, community if it's councils. based on them, they will know their own area, Mm -hmm. And it can be put to them to identify what is common good and what isn't. Mm -hmm. And they will have the attendance of the, presumably their local councillors, elected councillors. Mm -hmm. So it would be an easy thing to tack, that, tack the discussion of the common good onto the end of um, a community council meeting, or the beginning of. Okay, we'll leave that hanging. Mm -hmm. on, on the question of disposals, um, obviously this is one of the most complicated areas and leads to petitions to the court. Um, and I think um, we're talking about the difference between alienation, disposal and appropriation, uh, the difference between inalienable and alienable. Um, as Mr Ferguson, I think you're the author of a book on this topic, know all too well uh, these definitions themselves are not entirely uh, um, agreed uh, yet. I'm just wondering, as part of any reform, should we, and you've hinted at this already, be looking to simplify the process of how we decide whether, for example, a park in Edinburgh should be used for a school, which involves an appropriation, whether a long lease of 50 years should be given to a business for a bit of land by the River Clyde, um, whether a piece, whether a former city chamber should be sold uh, to somebody else, whether those, all those processes should be subject to a much simpler, no less transparent, but much simpler procedure, so that people are not faced with actually grappling with the complex legal questions about, is this an alienation, is it a disposal? Um, yes, in, in, in short, yes. <laughs> I think all, all of all of these issues are, are terribly interesting. If if you want to write a book about them, but actually, um, you know, to to uh, an extent, I, I do think. Well, why should the community not have just as much input into um, something which turns out to be on the alienable side of the fence as the inalienable ones? Obviously, the the, the really key ones like former borough chambers are, but. You know, in the end of the day, they're, they're, they're all part of the common the common good. Just to come back, if I could, about your point about the cities, I mean, I, th I think that is a, is a good point because whilst, yes, you can have a, a localised community council dealing with a particular asset in their part of Edinburgh, for example, um, it all ends up one, one pot, one fund. So um, w <coughs> without wanting to speak for my city colleagues, that there is an issue there about how you, how you have input from all the... All the um, smaller parts of quite a big community, obviously, in the case of the cities. OK, thanks. And I'm just wondering about, you know, where do we go from here? I mean, is it your view that Parliament needs to do something further on this question? Um, or is this kind of iterative every five years we do a little tweak to definitions and a tweak to um, the disposal regime um, adequate? That's a great question. So what would you change? And, and, and how could we do it? I, I, I would like to change Section 104 and add pe local people uh, to the same number as um, elected councillors so that there is some equality in the management, the local management of common good. Uh, that, at the moment, is just a, any member of a body that is approved for it, but there should be a number put on it. Okay, any other suggestions for what you would like to change? Put things back to the, the policy makers for what we could do differently, Mr Nevin? Abolish common good. Absolutely abolish common good. Uh, create parity with ordinary council assets. Allow the normal democratic process that we all work within in unitary authorities to uh, call to account councils who sell land or don't sell land or lease land or don't sell land. It's a hangover from the past. It's archaic. It's historically interesting. I love working with it. I've enjoyed working with it for the last 10 years. But it is not modern government. It really isn't. 
It does kind of leave our evidence session in a very odd place, given we're talking about cut-off dates and common good registers, but very, very challenging, yes. Um, yeah. any, Mr. F I'll, I'll let you back mm -hmm. in, Mr. Levin, Mr. Ferguson. Sorry, I, I, I maybe wouldn't quite go so far as abolishing, because I don't think you're going to do that. You're not going to get a lot of votes doing, doing that, to be quite frank with you, but um, I do think simplify. Um, do away with all these archaic distinctions between alienable, inalienable, create a simpler process for local authorities in terms of disposal and align it with the rest of community empowerment so that communities are involved um, in the in the decision making. That that's that's I think what I would suggest you're, you you should be looking for in your policy formation. Okay, I'll take it in a second, Doctor. Do you want to give others a chance to come in? In a second, Doctor Neil Craig Veach, did you want to add something? Yeah, just a short short piece to add um, uh, sorry I just lost what I was going to say um, we, yep. do, does parliament need to act or can we just leave things drifting uh, we can come back to it Dr Neil will come back to you if you want to kind of re respond to that. That, that that's fine Mr Veach um, Dr Neil will take you first and I'll come back to Mr Veach to add that if you abolish common good you will get a riot immediately in <laughs> Hoyk and I don't think that's a very good thing <laughs> Just wondering if anyone's represent Hoyk. Uh, okay, we can move next business then. Uh, Mr. Feech. Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, it was just to say that um, really we do want to simplify it to have a, a set procedure um, for common good, for common good mainly in terms of the the disposal appropriation um, of of it. And it the fact is the current the current wording in the 1973 Act says if a question arises. I mean, the, I mean, as Mr. Ferguson's written a chapter of his book about that that very question. So if we could just somehow get it more simplified, then it would it would really help help everyone. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to follow? I, I've got a brief question at the end, uh, Mr. Whiteman. Do you want to follow up on any uh, of that? Well, yeah. My, my question. I mean. Oh, oh, sorry, Mr. Apologies, Mr. Levin wanted in. My deputy, if you're not keeping me right here. So, sorry, Andy. No, it's okay. It's okay, Convener. Okay, okay, I, sp I suppose my question is that this, this issue has come up in Parliament every, on average, three to four years. And it's always been kind of put in a too difficult pile because Parliament has got a lot of business to get through, every committee's, and all the rest of it. M my question really is what, what urgency do you think? Do you think we should, do you think Parliament needs to act soon and in this session? Because this committee needs to come to some view as to what to do with this. And we could easily just sit after this in private session and agree that actually this is all a bit too difficult, but it's not really a priority. So I'm wanting to get some sense of the priority you think should be attached to reform in this area. And if it is about simplification, whether that shouldn't be too complicated a job, notwithstanding that there will be arguments about how simple ultimately <laughs> abolish is, is, is a total simple uh, argument. Uh, Mr. Levin. Short of abolishing, which I have to agree with, Mr. Ferguson may not get you votes. Uh, C certainly I, not in Hoyk, apparently, Mr. Not Levin. in Hoyk. We, we must avoid riots at all costs. I fully agree. However, uh, I would agree with my colleagues that definitions of alienability, uh, another difficult word for an ordinary Irish man to say, should be abolished. Uh, all that sort of nonsense should just go. It's got no place in modern law. But also what, what this committee could recommend, uh, and it could be done as a quick fix, and it's already been discussed, is to make the register legally definitive. It's an easy thing to do. And it's, it won't be without dispute, but it's, it still involves all your consultation. It allows bringing the local community with you. But we're going to spend time and resources that you've heard my colleagues saying, and I, and I <coughs> agree entirely, will cost us a lot in local authority to create a list that is still going to be disputed. Because common good is just a controversial area, and it always will be. But if you have a list and a cut-off date, and you say, if it's on, it is. If it's not, it isn't. That is a simple thing that could be done in this parliament and would lead to perhaps us not coming back for maybe five or six years this time. Abolish it, we'll never come back. <laughs> uh, hey, welcome back any time, Mr Levin. Dr Neil. Yeah. Um, God, what was I going to say? Um, never mind the abolition question. I think you should bring in 102 and 104 as soon as possible, and if possible, extend 104 to include more people who could act locally in the management of local common good. And, and I agree with all the things about getting a register in. 
Can I just ask, yeah. sorry, when you say... You bring in 102. Do you mean highlight the terms, or uh, what do you mean by bring in 102? I understand what you're saying about 104. Yes. But what do you mean by... 102, I'm agreeing about getting, you know, deciding what constitutes common good fund property. Okay. Right. But, but again, just, just for... We're coming to the end of our evidence session, but just for clarity, under the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015, 102 establishes a common good register. But the issue, just to right, is it's not a definitive register. Just because something's not on it doesn't mean it's not common good. You might you might get an extra degree of protection if it's on it, but even then witnesses seem to be arguing for a more streamlined process by which that land could still be disposed of for community benefit anyway. So it might be a degree of additional protection, and Mr Nevin was pointing out that's maybe a, an inequality in having greater protections for some public asset land and not others, which is why Mr Nevin was saying abolish the law and let's have reasonable protections and processes for disposing of all uh, community asset land. I just want you to have captured the situation accurately there, Mr Nevin. I, I think you've, you've got it right on, uh, Convener. The other thing I would say is we've had common good registers before. The borough councils had common good registers. And as Mr Ferguson says in his book, and I agree with him entirely, just because something is on a common good register from an old borough council does not mean that it's common good. We're now creating registers again in the 21st century. They haven't been definitive in the past. They're not going to be definitive today. So would the question for our committee to ask would be, what is the difference between disposal of community assets, whether it's in the common good or not in the common good register? That, that's a key question. But can, I, can we just... Final question, moving us away a little bit from what we were talking about. This committee is about to look at planning legislation. One of the key things within planning legisl legislation is to have local development plans every 10 years as, as opposed to every five years. Now, that seems a huge opportunity if we are going to have lists of these things to start doing audits and looking at. So I'm just wondering if you think that should focus the mind on the base the drive seems to be to have these lists in the first place. But also within that, there's the provisions to promote local place plans by communities. And again, I'm just wondering, whatever local place plans are being pursued by communities, whether there should be an obligation on the local authority at that point to, to an audit of land within the boundary of that area to assure itself what is or isn't common good. Is there or is there natural opportunities to do this separate from the Big Bang approach again? So I wonder if we're planning legislation that we're just about to look at in, in this parliament, if there's opportunities there in relation to some of that. Any thoughts? Mr Ferguson? I mean, I, th I think I hadn't thought about the planning bill, but the provisions of the planning bill and doing a, um, uh, stretching the, the LDPs to, to uh, 10 years and so on, uh, and the whole idea of placemaking, um, I think that does sit well with common good assets. And, and uh, I mean, I think, I'm not sure how you how you tie it together, but um, yes, it, it is part of the wider picture of um, a local authority with the communities looking at how things are um, how things are put together and where common good assets sit with all of that, and and look, really looking at them and saying, well, what's the what's the best use for this? What is the best use for it? Let's not put it in the too hard pile anymore. Let's look at it as part of our, our overall. Um, plan for for these communities. So um, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think to, just to go back briefly to, to Mr. Whiteman's last question. Um, yes, there have been one or two nips and tucks to legislation uh, about common good over the over the years. I've, and you do have weightier things to to talk about. Frankly, um, I, I would um, suggest to the committee um, have a look at what you think can be done to simplify things this time round, and and then um, leave it be. <laughs> I mean, I think that, Mr Nevin, I'm going to bring you in before we draw the... In fact, I'll bring you in, Mr Nevin, but I'll just signpost everyone else for you a final opportunity for any closing remarks. Just kind of marshal your thoughts just now, and I'll give you the opportunity if you wish. But I don't know the rest of the committee, my take-home message is actually it's not about whether something's in a common good register or not. The reason I mentioned the planning legislation is about how communities shape the assets in their area and can mould and shape the type of communities that they want and how land is used, irrespective of whether in 1907 uh, a, a Prime Minister decided to point at a bit of land and say that is or that isn't common good or you own that or you don't own that. I'm not sure how democratic that process is, was back then. 
uh, compared to the democratic standards we would have today about communities shaping uh, you know, the, the, the environment in which they live. So that would be my take-home message from that. If you think I've got that wrong, please tell me I've got it wrong uh, when you do your, your, your final comments. But Mr Nevin, I'll let you go first. Well, I was just going to say about the local plan idea, like Mr Ferguson, I hadn't thought about it, but it would certainly be, I, I, I see that as a, certainly a good idea. And also it might have the benefit, you get more community engagement with local plan because communities can see that they're talking about what's going to happen in the reasonably immediate future to their area in terms of schools, housing, etc. So those who engage with the consultation on the local plan are more likely, they're more likely to be more of them. And therefore, if they're also dealing with common good issues, you're going to catch those that otherwise, otherwise may not involve themselves in a purely common good consultation. Okay, thank you. And, and given that we went, went from left to right at the opening comments, let's go from right to left for cl any closing comments and remarks to Dr. Neil. Yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, as far as introducing the Act is concerned, there is still an out a chance for the minister to direct how it should be implemented under 103 and there are and also in 105 so there are opportunities to actually <clears throat> refine the act once it's through so i would advocate getting it through as far as, as as fast as possible and regarding the 107 map that would only identify to people what had been common good land and very often these are parcels of land or whatever, which are overlooked today. So it has that value. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Andrew Ferguson. Um, convener, I, th I think you've really helped me shape my own thinking on, on uh, um, where I, I would suggest you go with, with this. And it, it is about common good being part of a wider agenda of placemaking. I think that's a very good phrase to, to use. Um, the register will help to... to um, flush out difficulties and, and once local authorities have that register um, that's that's fine it'll be it'll be there and people can access it and the, it, it won't end all the arguments but at least it will um, set some sort of thing in, in place um, but in the end of the day the, the really crucial thing is about community involvement and as I said earlier that to me is part of um, a wider landscape of community empowerment communities getting involved through the, the planning bill, if that comes to pass, um, through the community empowerment legislation in deciding what happens to um, particular assets. Um, and that goes beyond borough boundaries as well. It happens in other communities too. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Mr Veach? Yeah, just my closing remarks would just be that, as we maybe just teased out towards the end of the discussion, that uh, the Community Empowerment Scotland Act um, and common common good and the history of common good aren't just sitting perfectly together right now. Um, we've seen that with, even though, you know, the, the, the government or the, the parliament's legislated regarding uh, community empowerment and asset transfers to the idea so that the communities could take back control of, of certain, um, you know, public public buildings not, in, not being used properly. But then they come, they may come into the, uh, hit the buffers with a common good query so the best thing, I think, would be to try and try and align align ourselves better and, and tidy up the common good legislation. And just sorry, one one further thing, we've got to remember that common the, the common good and the law protecting common good was generally there to stop misappropriation of funds by by councils in in history. But I think time has moved on now that. There's a lot of legislation that controls, you know, financial regulations control councils. They have to get the best value for all the assets they have. So, I mean, maybe moving, not quite abolishing common good, but let, let's have a look at it as soon as possible. OK. Um, can I thank all, all four witnesses this morning? Sorry if you're late before we started the evidence session. Hopefully you've got something out of it. I think we'll go back and read the official report and see where we take from it and where we go next as a committee. But thank you very much. So that main ends Agenda Item 3. And we now move to Agenda Item 4, which is previously agreed to take in private. So thank you very much. We now move into private session. <laughs>